Hey, it's Free Talk Live. You can dial in here. The toll-free number is 855-450-FREE-LIKE-FREEDOM. That's 855-450-3733. Coming up, we've got uh, censorship to talk about, plus the uh, lawsuit by Gavin McInnes, who is this, I don't know, right-wing guy, kind of? I wouldn't call him right-wing. No, I don't... Right-leaning moderate. Okay. Well, yeah, we'll see a little bit more about him. He's suing the Southern Poverty Law Center, and uh, that's an activist group that, I guess, tracks other activist groups that they don't like, Mm -hmm. uh, basically, and we can talk about uh, that. Aren't all comedians... Aren't all comedians these days who are like moderate, like just even like a little bit like right of, let's say, Bernie Sanders, um, aren't aren't they considered Nazis these days? If you're a comedian and you aren't like the most liberal of liberals, you're a Nazi. Is McGinnis a comedian? Yes. Oh, see, I had no idea. He does a lot of political work, but he's mostly a comedian. He's done some pretty good stuff. Is he like a stand-up comedian or like a skits kind of He does a show. He does like, you know, one of those talking head shows. I thought he's also done some stand-up. I think he has done some stand-up as well. So we can talk about that stuff. Uh, Plus, last week, Johnson, you were in here. uh, You do Tuesdays with us most of the time. And uh, there's going to be one day where Vin will be in this week, but you won't. Or not this week, but this month. And it's going to be a weird month because I'm leaving for Mexico tomorrow. And so we're not going to have our normal Tuesday show next week unless something drastic happens in Mexico and we can't broadcast from there for some reason. Uh, But... We're going to start with the story, Johnson, that you brought in last week, and we didn't get a chance to do it. And I said, bring it back in. Let's do it, because it did sound interesting. And uh, we we discussed, um, what was it, working last week, it's some aspect of jobs last week, and I'm spacing on uh, on what it was. But we, we talked about the, I think it was, was it millennials in working? Honestly, I don't even remember what it was. <laughs> we, ta- we talked about something jobs related last week and I thought, oh, it would have been, been great to cover this also at the same time. But we just, as it sometimes happens with Free Talk Live, we run out of time. So Ian Johnson and Laurel here in the studio tonight. Of course, you can bring up whatever's on your mind. We invite you to dial in toll free at 855-450-FREE, 855-450-3733. Also, the Discord on air call in line rooms over at discord.lrn.fm. So I do have that story up. If, you pulled uh, it up. Okay. Yeah. And this is from Reason.com. Yeah. So it's talking about an investigation into why uh, people are working. Oh, I remember. I'm sorry. I remember what it was. It right. was the article in the New York Times by a, a, a woman who was just bewildered right. as to why young people but actually why seemed, they would keep working. Why, seemed to like why working. Why people like their jobs. <laughs> right. They couldn't, she could not imagine why young people, presumably millennials, were actually interested in going to their jobs. The idea was just completely foreign to this person, and so we ended up talking about you know people who are in who do enjoy working and why they enjoy working, and you know just kind of getting into uh, that aspect of it. It was kind of Can an interesting. Can you story. imagine? Yeah, there's satisfaction <laughs> in participating in society and doing something that's valuable to other people. Yes, to there, help others get what they want. Exactly, yeah. there is satisfaction in a job well done. There's satisfaction in bringing home your own paycheck that you earned yourself. In I fact, know, that's listed as one of the top things for employers like a lot of the articles where it says if you want to have uh and keep millennials at your workplace one of the things that you need to offer you know besides you know perks and benefits to the job is um some sort of sense of meaning providing a job Mm. that provides that kind of sense of meaning otherwise presumably according to one of these silly articles millennials will leave because you know they just flit about from job to job, and if they don't find a satisfaction, well, then they're gone. And meeting doesn't have to be something as incredible as saving somebody's life or making a huge difference in somebody's life. It can be something as simple as, you know, fixing the railing on their front porch so now people aren't going to fall over. It's the satisfaction of doing something that needed to be done. Well, not only that, um, not only that needs to be done, there are things that you can just help people with and that you can, that people will appreciate you for. Mm -hmm. A good example of this is is um, my roommate, um, Matt, he is a prof- was a professional chef. He doesn't do that anymore because, honestly, it's not the best paying of work. It's hard work. Uh, it doesn't really necessarily pay well unless you happen to be at one of the fanciest you know, restaurants out there. But I, I've talked to multiple chefs who put so much effort into what it is that they do, and they're not doing it for the money. They really do it because they want to see people smile. They want to see people say to them, that was really delicious. Although and, they do expect to be paid. 
Well, no, yeah. of course. <laughs> I mean, it's not all ab- it's not all about getting right. you know somebody's appreciation, but you can get paid, and if nobody ever tells you your food's good, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it's not going to be the same. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's not going to be as satisfying of a thing because that's unless you make a tv show and tell other people how their food is terrible it's terrible (laughs) (laughs) there's satisfaction in that too there there are going to be exceptions to the to the rules obviously but every every chef i've ever known that's the their main reason for you know for doing it they want to satisfy their customer they want people to feel like they're a good chef and they've made a really delicious dish or whatever and whether it's uh you know something as a fancy restaurant or just your typical kind of average uh place that's one of the driving factors so just a a job well done in general whether mm-hmm. it's something that needed to be done because you didn't need to make a nice meal for somebody they could have eaten something that wasn't that nice that's true would've, it would have kept them alive um, but in this case they enjoyed the the whole process so we can get into the story but we're going to the phones first in this case it's going to be from reason.com so last week it was new york times kind of leftist sounding article written by somebody who clearly doesn't want to work and doesn't understand it (laughs) sounds like a leftist whereas with the folks over at reason.com normally these are people that are you know pretty libertarian writers Uh typically Mm -hmm. so it'll be interesting to see where they're coming from on this perspective of why do so many modern jobs seem pointless that's the uh, the title here but let's go first to ron in new york uh, the uh, the man obsessed already with the 2020 election. It's every single time uh, you've got something to say about it. Go ahead, Ron. What's what's the latest? Well, I bring tidings of good news. Bill Weld has left the building. He has left the Libertarian Party officially. He has rejoined the Republican Party, so uh, he's no longer our problem. Does he's isn't that a violation? Isn't that a violation of what he uh, promised not to do? Didn't he promise that he wasn't going to go back to the Republicans? Oh, but he's a politician. This is what right. they do all the time. Yeah. <laughs> just, I just thought that it was worth pointing that out. That this yeah. guy who the libertarians were so excited about because he was a former governor of Massachusetts, which for me was all I needed to know to know he was bad news, <laughs> uh, uh-huh. is now, you know, he's gone back on his promise that he wasn't going to rejoin the Republican Party. But this doesn't mean that he won't re rejoin. Uh, the libertarians or rejoin the libertarians because they can, for instance, the Republican primary is going to be over by the time the libertarians select their nominee. So if he fails yeah. at running for the Republican presidential nomination, which he likely will, mm-hmm. uh, he's going to yeah. he can then just throw his hat right back into the libertarian. Right. Yeah. But I've also heard a report that what he's what here's what I've heard is that he talked with Justin Amash. Um, and Justin Amash is going to run for the Libertarian nomination, and Bill Weld is going to run for the Republican nomination. Uh, and Bill Weld's probably going to fall flat on his face, but he doesn't know that yet. I've uh, heard he's done that a few times from heavy drinking. <laughs> that's what I've heard right now. But mm-hmm. they're saying in two weeks, like on February 15th, he's going to make an announcement in Concord, New Hampshire. And typically, when you set up in a, a, a big announcement in a certain place, it's not to say, "Oh, I'm not running for president," which means yeah, he's, he's probably in as a Republican. Yeah, that's that's what it's that's what it's sounding like. Although he did endorse Hillary Clinton uh, while he was running for the Libertarian Party's presidential or vice presidential nomination, he, well, while he had received it, so he was their vice presidential nominee. He got on television yeah. and basically endorsed Hillary on more than one occasion. So maybe he'll pop yeah. up in the Democrats. Who knows? Yeah. Well, I'd love to see if he runs as a Republican. Is he now going to have to mold himself as like a right wing Tea Party pro life? anti-gay marriage conservative now. I doubt it. For most of his life, he's been a a Democrat registered as a Republican. I don't know. We'll Uh, see. I don't know enough about the guy, and honestly, I find him very distasteful as far as, you know, political candidates are concerned. But then again, that's true for me, for most politicians. Ron, thanks for the call. In fact, I'm going to put you on hold here. We're going to see if we can improve your call quality since you've called more than a a couple times. Uh, I'm going to have you talk to the board operator, and we're going to see if we can improve that uh, because his his levels are kind of like all over the place. He's real quiet, and it gets real loud. Toll-free number here, 855-450-FREE. Jobs, modern jobs. Why do so many seem pointless? Johnson, you're going to look into that with us here in moments. Your calls and thoughts are also welcome on whatever's on your mind. You can take control of the airwaves here on Free Talk Live. Hey, it's Free Talk Live. 
You dial in toll-free here. Bring up anything that you want. The number is 855-450-FREE. That's 855-450-3733. You can, of course, take control of the airwaves. That's the point of Free Talk Live. And it's brought to you by Liberty.menu. If you are an individual who rejects the initiation of force and agrees to abide by the ethics of the non-aggression principle, then Liberty.menu is for you. If you aren't those things, then don't go to Liberty.menu because you're not welcome. Uh, But if you are a a libertarian type, then you would really appreciate Liberty.menu because it can connect you to other liberty-friendly business owners. Because if you, you know, want to get a thing or a service of some sort, doesn't it make sense to buy from somebody who is ideologically compatible with you as opposed to, say, somebody who is against your beliefs and is then going to use the profits they make against you? Uh, so go to liberty.menu and use code FTL. You can submit whatever you want. So if you have a business or maybe more than one business or maybe you're a content producer like you, Laurel, you've got your own YouTube channel. Yes. Um, so content producers are welcome. Businesses are welcome. Events or welcome people that are making, you know, coordinators of events and that kind of thing. Go to liberty.menu. You can use code FTL and get a special Free Talk Live listener badge on your profile. We can't give you a discount because it's free to use liberty.menu. So get on over there and check it out. It's liberty.menu. Let's continue here with uh, more of your thoughts. Matthew's on the line in Louisiana listening via TuneIn. And uh, go ahead, Matthew. Yeah, and Laurel, you'll really enjoy the cost of liberty.menu. It's free. <laughs> Yes, it is. That's my favorite uh, price. Right. Um, by the way, totally enjoyed your last video about poll numbers and the opposite number poll numbers. Yep. Um, How do people find so your what? YouTube channel? It's Laurel. Just go to YouTube and Google Laurel and you'll find me in YouTube. I just don't think that's going to work. I mean, there's a lot of Laurels on YouTube. There's nothing there's else not, that they can... There's not a really? lot of Laurels on YouTube. Okay. I'm going to try it here and I'm going to let you know what my results are. It's a total code. Uh, uh, it means law. The total what? Uh, it's a code word. It means law. What code word? Uh, oh, it's a bad joke. Don't okay. worry about it. it died. <laughs> that joke okay. died mercifully. Do not try to revive it. I don't even know what Wait, you're talking about. So it's a terrible, say. terrible mean. Do you remember the blue dress, black? Um... Oh, you're talking about the Yanny Laurel oh, thing? The Yanny. That's okay. the first thing yeah. that comes up yeah, when you oh, when dear. you search for that Laurel. Might come up, yeah. Um, I am not seeing your your channel here in okay, the first Okay, if you page. want to just type it in, it's youtube.com slash C slash Laurel's channel. Laurel's channel. Yes. Okay. All right. That's a little easier. Very good. Okay, so, uh, Matthew, go ahead. Last night I was listening to I was listening to uh, the last bit of the show they replayed it this morning on WGSO, and it was a guy talking about the Constitution, and I believe it was you, Ian, who said that basically that didn't work, did not work. I'm not sure if I entirely agree with you, but I do think we are a long way from what the founders had in mind, and the reason is. The founders never envisioned a system where everybody who is a citizen would get the sovereign franchise. They had some restrictions when they first set up the Constitution, and I think it was you had to own real property. You're talking about for voting? For voting. That is what the sovereign franchise means. Okay. You get to decide what, you know, the representatives are and in whose interest they represent well i think what i uh was saying was that the uh, it was sort of a sum a summary of what uh, lysander spooner said about the constitution was that it was either powerless to prevent the government that we have today or that it authorized it i mean it's one or the other so which what's your preference well my contention is that basically we voted for the government we have now well Um, i didn't well no you didn't but I guarantee you, uh, say you have an election, 51% say, yay, we win, we get to implement our policies. The other 49% says, oh, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, to incorrectly quote Winston Churchill, he said, democracy is the absolute worst type of government except for all the others. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's correct. I mean, I think that... uh, the The other choice that has a decent track record in one country, and that would be monarchy, and that was the only country where I can find that it has a decent, not a good track record, was 
uh, basically England, later to Great Britain. But then they started to just kind of go from basically a system of individual liberty that they won at great, great cost during the Peasants' Revolt, and then they just started frittering their liberties away. And now it's, you know, it's better than the EU, but only slightly. Mm-hmm. And if they don't Brexit, it, it looks really bad over in Europe. Well, I think I mean, now that we're seeing what? now that we're seeing a crackdown on people who have a difference of opinion, it's becoming much more obvious how important the Bill of Rights in the United States is because they don't have it in the UK because they don't have it in Europe, and we're seeing what a difference that makes when somebody like Count Dankula can be Count Dankula. Yes, he is a YouTube creator, <laughs> oh, he's- and he made he made some jokes people didn't like, okay. and he was arrested, tried, Whoa. and convicted for making jokes this on his YouTube channel. This is channel. the gentleman, I'm sure you're aware of him, that made his girlfriend's dog salute like a Nazi. Oh, yeah, he's that got the, guy. the Nazi dog. Oh. But he didn't hurt anybody. No. Nobody He's was hurt injured. someone's feelings. It was a big joke. He has since become very, very famous on YouTube. And he, really? He's, like, he's he was, a very big... He How much was time did he go to jail convicted. for? Um, well, he was ordered to pay a fine, and he refused to pay. Good. And they're appealing it. I think it's currently in appeals. And what was his name? Count what? Count Dankula. Dankula. <laughs> He's a Scottish right. guy. That's yeah, great. He, he speaks some other language besides English. I'm not sure Scottish. what he is. all right matthew so Uh, what are you trying to say here about the constitution i'm not real clear are you saying that it's actually you know worthwhile i think if i really don't know i really don't know i because by and large we're not as bad off as a lot of other places that Mm. don't have yeah, but tell uh, that to the people I, that the United States I, government has bombed to death. How do you think they feel well, about it? I was talking about people who live in other countries, mind you. I was talking about those who live here. No, that I understand what you're saying. Bombs on, they may want to return the favor. But the original That's you know, problem. point of the, the United States, one of them, was to not have a standing military and to only form the you know that army at times when you know defense was necessary. And now you have a uh, occupying force going out into hundred, you know, over a hundred countries around the the world and dropping bombs in multiple places over many years, killing many innocent people. That was not the original intention of the founding fathers, right? So, I mean, the Constitution has no, been an it abject warned, failure. They did warn us against that, but originally, the you know, the standing army was formed after the War of 1812, when it was mm-hmm. pretty obvious that whistling up the militia and going against the world's greatest fighting force on land was not all that successful until uh, Old Hickory beat them back not too far away from where I live. I think uh, we would have been fine without the standing army. But thank you, Matthew, for the call tonight. I appreciate it. Uh, The toll-free number here is 855-453. That's 855-450-3733. You want to comment, was the Constitution, is the Constitution an abject failure? It is not. Uh, I think it is. We can get into that coming up here in moments. Depends on, I guess, what you think its goals were. This is Free Talk Live. Bitcoin.com is delighted to announce their latest partnership with the gift card specialist at eGifter. With many of the world's leading brands on their roster, it is now easier than ever to get the gift cards of your favorite brands with Bitcoin Cash. To get started, just follow these simple steps. Visit giftcards.bitcoin.com, pick the gift card you want, Follow the instructions on your screen and make your payment using your Bitcoin Cash wallet. Sit tight and your gift card will be delivered to you as soon as it's ready. That's giftcards.bitcoin.com. It's Free Talk Live. Dial in, toll free, bring up whatever you want. You can take control of the airwaves here. Our number is 855-450-FREE, like freedom. That's 855-450-3733. In the studio tonight, it's Ian. And Johnson. I'm Laurel. Coming up, we're going to tell you about uh, the story we promised last Tuesday night, the uh, the one about why do so many modern jobs seem pointless? We're going to get into that coming up here, Johnson. You've got that to share. Also, on the way very, very soon, we are less than uh, basically a week and a half at this point away from Anarchapulco. 
And you can still go to anarchapolco.com. Maybe this will not be a sellout event, which that said, it's going to be mostly sold out. It's going to be darn close to it because they'd sold, I think, over 2,500 tickets, and that was like a month ago. So they got to be getting close. Anarchapolco.com, code FTL. This is the first year Anarchapolco will be so big. Uh, last year it was 1,700 tickets, and they did sell out. Um, having Ron Paul speak at your event tends to do that. In fact, they're having Ron Paul come back this year, as well as Judge Napolitano for the very first time ever. There will be dozens of other great speakers who are going to be performing there, discussing entrepreneurship, investment, uh, politics, philosophy, health, sustainability, lifestyles, and personal relationships for four days among the sun and beaches of a world-class resort. It was such a success last year that they have rented the entire resort this time. So everyone you see walking around is either going to be a hotel staff or they're going to be attending Anarchapulco, which is pretty cool. Uh, And again, there was a lot of people there last year. It's going to be even bigger this year, and uh, you'll love it if you can make it down there. It's not too late to get your tickets over at Anarchapulco.com. And yes, you can use coupon code FTL, and that will snag you a discount because you are a Free Talk Live listener. And we will be broadcasting from Anarchapulco, so don't miss us there. Mark's already down in Acapulco right now. He's been there basically for the last five days. So I'll be heading down there tomorrow. And uh, Chris Reitman will be coming in to head up the show on Wednesday night. I think he's going to have Will Coley and Vincent in with him. So we'll have another live show from this studio. And then hopefully we'll be broadcasting from Acapulco as long as everything goes smoothly. I don't know what the internet connection is going to be like there yet. So there's there, you know, there's some question marks that you don't really know what's going to be until you actually get there and, and try it out. So anarchapolco.com, code FTL. We will see you there. Let's go to the phones here. Uh, to the fun, or maybe not so much fun. This person calls themselves angry, calling from New York. You're on Free Talk Live. Hello there. Hey there, guys. How you doing? It's me, Dave. Oh, uh, Dave from New I... York. Okay. You're calling yourself yeah. angry tonight, or is this what the board op wrote about you? The what? They put in "angry" as your name on the call screening software. Did you actually tell the the call the call screener that you your name was "angry" tonight? Yes. Okay. What are you upset about? Okay. What am Always I? Always something my, with this guy. Ex, Go ahead. Yeah, my ex best friend. Uh, my ex best friend in Boston. Um, he decided we don't we don't talk on Zello. It's it's a uh, walkie talkie app. Me, mm-hmm. Nickel Hood, TJ, and a bunch of other you know people. Whatever. Yeah, we don't know who they are. Um, yeah, the whole uh, gang. He, there's this guy named Mook H who I freaking hate, and Ticklewood decided to give this guy a star. Now, me and Ticklewood have been friends for like many, many, many years, and this guy Mook H is a creep. He's a stalker. I don't like him. Everybody knows. Have you told him that like to his him. face? <laughs> I don't know who. Oh my god. I've never met this creepy stalker. Well, but I think you should say that to his face. Luke H is across. <laughs> he's he's, he's out in the west somewhere. You're referencing one of his videos, ever. right? Yes. Okay, so for listeners who I'm, don't know, uh, and Laurel also, you've probably never heard this person before. No. Uh, this is Dave in New York. Why did you delete your YouTube channel, Dave? I didn't. I, I have other channels. Anyway. Whoa, 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 wait, wait. Whoa. What's the current channel that you're uploading to? point is i don't wait a minute you can't just come on here and be a youtube celebrity and not tell us where i i dressed up as you for halloween one year that's right and i can't even show people to explain the costume that i have pictures of because the video's down yeah you should have saved it first because i i kind of look a little bit like you dave especially when i put on the uh the angry birds hat and the uh, sunglasses (laughs) and i shaved my i shaved my beard to look uh you know similar facial hair and it was Mm -hmm. i I thought it was a pretty good it was dead on it was dead Uh, on yeah okay there uh what, what is the name of the hot chick you have on here tonight the hot chick. Well, um, you mean I, Ian? I presume. <laughs> I presume you're talking about Laurel, who also is a yeah. YouTuber. Now, Laurel gave yes. us her YouTube channel. I did, which is slash Laurel's channel on YouTube. You don't even yes. have to use the C. I tried taking. Oh, the really? C out. Okay, yeah. so you just you put can it get it either channel. way. Okay. Slash Laurel's channel. So, what is your current YouTube? Because for years, uh, you've been calling into this show about something or another that you're angry about. You're perennially angry. And years ago, we learned that you had your own YouTube channel. It used to be called Hudson Valley Guy and then the number one. And at some point, you got a hair up your butt and you deleted all the videos on the channel. 
and then you started posting videos to the channel again, and then at some point you deleted them again. So like you have this sort of back and forth with sounds like me with Facebook, like committing to and then not committing to and abandoning your channel. So now you're going to get on here and tease us and claim you've got a channel, but you won't say where. Where is it at? What's the channel name? Uh, it's, it's not really like a channel. It's just it's a bunch of uh, letters and numbers. I, I can't really figure out how, how to. Oh, is that well, so? What do I? What do we search for to find what's your what's your most popular video? Uh, I don't have a a, a popular video. <laughs> Anyway, point being is that I don't like Mook Age. Everybody knows. Okay, hold on. Like Look, Mook nobody. Wait, wait, wait. Why do you care so much about this Mook guy on the internet? Because Picklewood, my ex best friend, he decided to give this this mofo a star in a channel called We're Not Cops on Zello. A star is that something special? I mean, what does the star mean on on Zello? This is a two way audio transmission app, right? Yeah, he he made him a, a moderator, like like a star, uh, like, a, like a double moderator. So you your know, ex you know, best friend of. made somebody you don't like on the internet a moderator of a channel that you hang out in. I want to hear a rant about this on Hudson Valley Guy yeah. One uh, the, on YouTube. Uh, the channel name is called <laughs> Word Not Cops on Zello. Yeah, you mentioned that, but that's what you're upset about. You're upset because your ex best friend. Now, how did he become your ex uh, your ex best friend? I've known him for many, many, many years, and this guy, Mook H, you know, he, he, he is a creeper, a stalker. I don't like him. He, he, you sure he, you're not projecting? Uh, like, <laughs> I just don't like him, and, and, and his, his voice is... Okay. Oh, no, no, that's a legitimate, you know, that's like a legitimate reason, right? Like, if you're on an audio app and somebody's got a really shrill, uncomfortable voice to listen to, that's a reason to, you know, to not like being in a channel with that person. But why do you continue to hang out there if it's so upsetting to you? Because you know, everybody knows I don't like Mook H. Shane, Jared, uh, Tristan, we don't we don't um, need the chat room. Jeff, listing. Fred, <laughs> Billy, <laughs> they we, all know. We do, we don't need the whole laundry list of who's in the chat room. But you didn't answer my question. I asked you if there's a person in a chat room who you don't like. And now that person has been given moderator capabilities over that chat room because it was one thing when they were just the same level as you. Now they could technically kick you out or, you know, mute you or whatever it is that a moderator can do in one of these uh, chat rooms. Uh, Why do you continue to stick around if you hate him so much? I don't because I'm 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 trying to tell my, my I'm trying to tell Dicko to uh, delete to get rid of Mook H. I also don't like Chuck. Chuck is a local freaking idiot. Uh, and, and you should just Mook tell H. Chuck and Mook H to stop leeching off the channel. <laughs> tell them tell them that they're they're being pedos. And to get out of here. Okay, so I feel like I have to keep explaining your uh, your in jokes here because you know a lot of listeners nobody can go find the YouTube videos anymore. Well, right, a lot of listeners weren't around back when uh, back when Dave first called the show. This is some of his original video content where he would get upset because when he's been going in these channels for years. Just to let you know, Laurel, back when he first called this program, and are they are they like this call? Yeah, like I, I hate no this idea. person because of I've this. Never... There was some of oh that. God. Have you actually okay, been in one of these okay, channels? Okay, no, okay. we all get the idea. We all get the idea. Tell them to get a job. I mean, that's really (laughs) what you should do is just tell them to get off the channel and to go get a job. So Dave has been historically just perennially upset because he goes into these channels. This was actually originally what he called about a long time ago was him getting made fun of on these various different chat groups that he's a part of. And my question to him then, as it is now, is if you are uncomfortable in a place, if you don't like the people in a place, why do you continue to go? And be made fun of. He got called those names that you were talking about, right. and then he made videos where he kept repeating over and over again, because Dave likes to repeat himself, uh, those things that people said about him. There's- it's Free Talk Live. Dial toll free. Join us here. The number is 855-450-FREE. It's 855-450-3733. We have the Discord on-air call-in line rooms over at discord.lrn.fm. But if you want to do it the old-fashioned way, you can still use the phones. The number is 855-450-FREE. That's 
Four five zero three seven three three. Joining you in the studio tonight, it's Ian and Johnson. I'm Laurel. Laurel, uh, you are being introduced here to Dave in New York. He is from the Poughkeepsie area, calling in tonight. He's mad about something that happened to him on the internet and something that has continued happening to him. Dave, when did you start calling this show? Was it like 2012 or 2010 or something like that? Do you remember? I don't like Mook H, okay? <laughs> I don't know why Pickerwood will not get rid of Mook H. Because okay. I have told everybody, Shane, Jared, TJ. Hey, you know- hey, hold on there, buddy. Listen. I told you we don't need to have the whole laundry list of names. Now, I know you but love wait, to repeat yourself. have you yourself. told Mook H? That's the only one that's important <laughs> out of that entire list. Of have you told Craig? Have you told Mook H? I have, have never met him. He lives on the other side. Wait, of what do you want you to tell him? You have to meet you him. Like you him? have to go meet him and tell him to his face. I am not going to. Yeah, wait, where does he live? Wait. He, he lives on, on the West Coast. Oh, okay. That's yeah, a long well, you got to go out there to the West Coast. You need you to set up a table and chair match. Ticket. I mean, could could you even buy a Greyhound ticket, Dave? Do you have I enough welfare like money? LRN.FM. All right, earlier. He said MF or earlier. He was doing all right. That's too bad because I really wanted to get into uh, a little bit more about that with Dave and like why it is that he just continues to subject himself to this. He must like it, right? Like he must, there must be something about this online conflict that draws him in. He loves to have people hate him, well, I think. That's why I suggest that he go out to the West Coast and set up a table and chair match. Because clearly he's playing the villain in his own little WWE saga. <laughs> <laughs> he is. He does seem to be a wrestling fan. Yeah. Uh, a lot of his videos. And you did find somebody that archived at least one of his videos. Yeah, I, uh, what I did you search that for? To our chat. Um, I am not a leech. I'm not a leech on on YouTube. So yeah, yeah. if you want to see a classic, um, uh, and it's from uh, the channel Man Child Adventures. That's right. They got a few of his videos. I think. <laughs> well, what does he do for a living? Do you know? Nothing. Um, he has been he looking is not for a, a job. Leech. He is not a pillow. He, <laughs> he appears to be able bodied. He is definitely able bodied. However, he lives in some kind of welfare house um, ah. and re- I presume receives welfare because he doesn't work. Uh-huh. So, um, unless he has gotten a job recently, I know every now and then he'll call in to say he's gotten a job, but he usually is looking for a job. And usually when he gets a job, they, he doesn't keep it very long because. Well, Dave's pretty crazy, so it's hard to uh, hard to deal with a person who's always having interpersonal conflicts. Uh, as you might imagine, if he has conflicts with people on the internet, he probably has them with people at the office or wherever it is that he might be able to to find a job. I'm just guessing on that one, knowing you know uh, what I know about Dave from the years of him calling this show. He doesn't call very often these days. It's maybe like two or three times a year. Uh, but there was a time when we would hear from Dave at least on a weekly basis, if not maybe for a short time uh, daily. And it's always something he's mad about, some sort of interaction he's had with somebody where he's unhappy. He's just one of the most perennially angry people uh, that has uh, has ever called this show. And it's sad for Dave, but it's entertaining as hell for the rest of us. So you, you do like a, a, a discussion like this afterwards where you talk about him like this and then he still calls back? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Huh. Oh, I don't know when he'll call back, but he will definitely call back because he. So if you were to watch, doesn't he get mad at you for saying these things? Maybe I don't know. Okay, it really doesn't matter. Um, but uh, he, if you'd watch some of his original videos, he's got a thing for calling radio as well. So ah. um, on his original channel, Hudson Valley Guy One on YouTube, which we found years ago when he first called the show. Um, he had videos of him calling, just videos of audio, basically, of him calling like the local rock radio station and requesting a song or something like that. He's just always been kind of like a radio caller guy. Uh-huh. And so he calls our show. He's actually called Chris Cantwell's show uh-huh. as well. How did that go? Um, well, much more abusive uh, because Chris <laughs> yeah. is... Chris won't, you know, Chris is, is very abusive to his callers, and uh-huh. uh, that's sort of part and parcel of, you know, what happens when you call the Chris Cantwell show, especially if you're Dave in New York. So Chris just rips him up one end from the other, and Dave will call, just continues to call back. Huh, okay. So he, he appears to like the abuse while at the same time complaining about it. It gives him something to complain about later on. Yes. 
So that's Which is what he wants. That's Dave uh, in New York. Toll free number eight fifty five four fifty free. Let's go to Mike calling from Wisconsin. Uh, you're on Free Talk Live, watching us on Twitch LRN FM. Go ahead. I'm actually just listening over uh, the phone line. I, uh, oh, you know, right. I did kind of, I did put in kind of a fake a fake prank call last Tuesday because Johnson was on the air. Oh, hey. I actually wanted to call about something serious. Well, welcome uh, back. And thank you. And uh, and I just kind of wanted to pose this out there because this is something that I've kind of had, uh, you know, just ruminations on. Um, you know, I, I know that you know Ian and the bulk of the participants on the show. Are uh, will probably identify themselves as you know voluntarists. I don't know if Laurel. Anarchists. I don't know how Laurel would identify herself. I'm still working on that actually because okay. it seems to be in transition. Aren't we all? Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> yeah, and and so you know, on a certain level, like um, you know, you know, free people should have no boundaries. Like, I absolutely agree, right? Um, we should be able to to traverse the earth as we see fit, so long as we don't. That would be the ideal in an ideal world. I would love it if that was practical, but I think there are some practical issues with that. Yeah, yeah, and and I I can kind of see that, and I'm kind of posing this question to 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 kind of help you know uh, stick a jump button on on my further understanding of of the philosophy. You know, I, I in an I in, in a petri dish, I understand. I'm kind of with you, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but what happens when uh, after how many dozens of decades of disastrous foreign policy and the uh, not necessarily the hatred of the entire world, but you know there are, there are, there are large groups, large segments of uh, you know populations across the planet that do not think highly of uh, the people that reside within these borders mm-hmm. and or, or or their government, and and so uh, on one level it's like I don't. I don't necessarily blame Donald Trump for wanting to build a wall. However, uh, I'm kind of caught between the two because we've pissed off so many people that uh, such a, you know, if, if, the, if the border is as porous as the mainstream media would like us to think it is, which it may be, may not be. It is. Um, yeah. Then, then like, how do we, like, like we're stuck living here and, and the, the, no, if you the have enough money, you can leave. <laughs> well, I, I, I for one go. do not. Yeah, I for one you do can, not. You can and... buy a, you can buy a pass out of the country if if you have enough money. So, I mean, are you saying that? Let me see if I'm understanding what you're saying so far. So, you're saying okay. that sure. U.S. foreign policy invading and destroying innocent lives around the globe is setting people off. They're making them mad about the United States government, maybe mad about the people in the United States, and so therefore. There needs to be some sort of, in your mind, there ought to be some sort of restrictions no. at the border? No. Okay. No, not necessarily in my mind that I think that. However, I mean, like, you know, terrorism is a tool of the desperate. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's how they, it's also the tool that's of the how they make it. A- a- absolutely. And a- yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And, uh, we, we, and we also know there are false flag events and all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So, like, ha- like, if, like, we're all, like, for people that can't afford to buy you know, citizenship to another country. And I mean, I live in Wisconsin. Like I don't fear Canadians all that much. And chances yeah. are, you know, coming across the Southern border, um, those people might necess- might have a lot more to fear in terms of these, you know, uh, nefarious actors. There's not really any know, evidence for it. The border. There's not really any evidence no, for it. No I mean, evidence for what? I, well, the fact is uh, from what I, from, I think it was the American conservative magazine did a long piece about immigrants and statistics uh-huh. and looked and saw that, um, they're less likely to actually commit violence than even native-born uh, people. Well, so, legal immigrants have a very low crime rate. Even illegal ones. It's it's higher if you than exempt, most If Americans. you exempt the crime of crossing the border without asking for permission, right. if, you, if you're only right. looking at actual violent crime, right. then it's actually lower than the native-borns, even among people who are Ill- so-called illegal. There are places in the United States that have extremely high... Uh, violent crime rates. Mm-hmm. If you Chicago, like Chicago or there, Baltimore, if you re- and it's actually only about I think two percent of the neighborhoods. When you remove those two percent of the neighborhoods out, then mm. you get a different number for the crime rate for the rest of the United States, and that is lower than for illegal aliens. That, that would uh, well. So, it, and, and my my question is 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 do we just take the complete laissez faire attitude of just like, eh, you know, like it's, what what's going to happen is going to happen, or should there be some measure of uh, support for for those that are kind of stuck? You know, within, you know, uh, 
these kind of porous borders. I so mean, when you say support, like, what do you? I I, I want to find out more about what you mean. Hang on, um, Mike, because I'm still not real sure of what the question is or what it is that you're trying to say. So we'll uh, continue because it sounds like it's a good conversation. I'm just not really sure where anybody's at in it yet. Uh, the toll-free number is 855-450-FREE. That's 855-450-3733. And Laurel's an immigration attorney, so yes. she knows a thing or two about the topic. More com- she seems happier. Her fur is so much shinier, silkier, softer. She has really mellowed a lot. Sheba is a 105 lean pounds of shiny, smooth, happy dog for life. The shedding is stopped. The itching is stopped. Since 2001, we've helped more than a quarter million dogs get over their nutritional deficiency miseries. And saved our customers bazillions in vet bills. Everything we tried failed except the Dynavite. Come to Dynavite for help. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. If you want the dog to be healthy, you got to feed it something healthy. The omega-3 fatty acids. Flaxseed, zinc, alfalfa. The digestive enzymes that are cooked out of regular dog food. Dynavite is nutrition. Dynavite for life. Don't let your dog itch, scratch, stink, or shed like crazy. Come to Dynavite for help. 859-428-1000. 859-428-1000. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E oh. dot com. Free Talk Live. It's Free Talk Live. You can dial in toll free, bring up what you want. Our number here is 855 450 free, like freedom. That's 855 450 3733. We've got the Discord on air call in line rooms over at Discord. Dot lrn.fm joining you tonight it's ian and johnson i'm laurel and we're going to continue here on the way johnson you've got a story that uh, we've been trying to share for a couple weeks now we just haven't had a chance so hopefully we'll get to it uh over at reason.com why do so many modern jobs seem pointless but we take your calls and thoughts first here mike is on the line in madison wisconsin now mike you uh said you're listening over your phone tonight uh, wanted to have you explain a little bit more about what your purpose of calling, where you, what point you're trying to drive at, or the question that you're trying trying to ask. It has to do with immigration. It has to do with freedom to travel. Um, but the fear I, I've heard some, you know, sort of the fear of uh, the United States government creating terrorism out in the world, and you know, bas- basically making terrorists who hadn't been terrorists previously by killing their family members, for instance, in uh, bombing raids. It sounds innocence. like you're saying it's our fault that people are killing us. That it's yeah. the United States' no. fault. Yeah, it's the U.S. Oh, government's well, I mean, fault. To some extent. Yeah, to some it's extent, called not, blowback. Not our fault. Ron Paul wrote a book yeah, about it. Yeah, so, like, yeah, no, uh, the idea is, obviously, it's the fault of the killer who sets a bomb off, right? Like, if there's a suicide bomber, they're the ones doing that killing. Right. But they wouldn't have done the killing had their own family likely not been eradicated from, you know, the planet uh, by a bombing raid by the United States federal government. In the same way that if uh, – the way you can get Americans to admit this is to ask, well, if the Red Chinese started bombing your neighborhoods, would you want to go over potentially – let's say your whole family got eliminated by a Chinese bombing raid – would that potentially make somebody from the United States want to go over to China and bomb some targets over there? And most of them would say, yeah, that would make them want to do that. So uh, violence begets violence. And that's just sort of the history of the world. That is the history Correct. of the world. And it goes back and it goes back and forth. And so and quite it takes often... one person to break the cycle. You got you to gotta stop it at some point. You have to accept whatever it is that's happened. Forgive the person who, who did it to you and move on with your life. Because if you just... Turn it right back around against them. It's going to come back against you, and then it just it keeps going until you're dead. I agree with you there that we should stop doing things that would not be. We should do, stop be doing. We should stop doing things that are morally wrong. And you mean the government? Her, right? Yes, correct. <laughs> presumably, you and I aren't doing things morally wrong. You well, I am, but well, that's, that's your problem. <laughs> but we are talking about. Uh, you know, uh, doing things in other countries. So you are correct. I agree mm-hmm. with you there. Yeah. However, until that has an effect. We do have to be careful about terrorists coming into the United States. No, you but don't. I you, don't think. Oh, we you, don't. No, you don't. Because if, if at least if you're in a place like New Hampshire where you can own guns and you uh-huh. can own weapons to defend yourself and your loved ones and your neighbors, then no, you don't have a problem with with terrorism because any sort of incident is going to get stopped real fast if somebody tries something. Like we don't need somebody carries a backpack onto a bus yep. and leaves it under a seat. 
and you you're packing a gun and that bomb goes off. Well, there's nothing you can do in that case. Yeah. <laughs> but in a lot of cases, you know, you're going to be able to do something about it. And the fact is somebody can put a, bo- a backpack bomb on a bus anywhere, anytime, and there's no way that, you know, I'm sorry, I don't want to have a TSA at every single bus station. Yeah, neither do I. I don't want to have a TSA at every single parking lot. I don't want to have a, you know, border patrol at every, uh, you know, main, main, main intersection or whatever. I don't want to have checkpoints as I go to work. I'm not interested in those things. And I'm the, that means that you're taking risk, right? Because if you don't have a bunch of men with guns if, around. If we didn't have yeah. the government enforced nonsense with the security, we would probably have some kind of Real security because people would be able to choose between like let's say there was a bus line that had a scanner and bus lines mm-hmm. that didn't you would be able to opt you know with the bus line that for example maybe allowed open carry but also had scanners to well, like, because we have so many choices of buses out here in new hampshire well no i suspect no. that if if there were going to be such a choice it would only happen in the market after bombings started right, right. like if there's no bombings then why is a bus line going to install right, security right but if there are bombings then all of a sudden like you but remember the tsa would you think the tsa just happened yeah. out of nowhere you know, do, like- do you remember <laughs> um the uh, washington dc shooters from like a decade ago yeah. yes. the two from guys the, yeah. that were from the trunk right. of the car right, right. Yeah. so they were shooting people from a long distance with a rifle and so no Nobody knew where the, the shots right. were coming from. They were shooting people at gas stations, right? Mm-hmm. And so we, we were actually on the air during this thing happening, and we were covering it and talking about it. And what was interesting was how the marketplace came up with security that was actually effective, right? Because gas stations uh, would like to stay in business, and if their customers are getting shot while they're pumping their gas, then that's going to mean those customers are likely to not come there because they're going to go outside of the area or something because they're worried about getting shot. Um, but the gas stations, I remember one of them had like these uh, drapes almost, like bulletproof drapes that they ended up installing over the kind of the gas pump area to where you can pull your car in and you could pump and whoever it was that might be looking to shoot at you wouldn't be able to see where you were at the pump. So the marketplace came up with a protective method. In the case of buses, they would come up with whatever they needed to to keep their customers safe. The gas stations came up with what they needed to to keep their customers safe. And the ones that didn't lost business to the ones that did. So I don't believe, as far as security is concerned, I don't believe in the government providing security because it's always going to be one size fits all. It's going to be garbage like the TSA. It's going to cost way too much money and it's not going to be effective. So why not just let the market do it? Well, for the visas, I mean, we can argue about the TSA because I do agree that they're not as effective as they should be. But well, and a lot of it, TSA. a lot of it is security theater. Yeah. But a lot of potential terrorists are caught when they're applying for visas and they're denied visas to get into the country in the first place, and they pay an application fee to have that review, so it doesn't cost the taxpayer anything. Are you mm-hmm. saying we should get rid of that layer yeah, I think of security? The whole, I think the whole government should go away. I mean, I think the whole federal government is useless and evil, and it hurts peaceful people. And what about all the people coming from other countries who can't afford the application yeah. fees, who literally work for months and months, if not years of their lives, just to get the application fee scraped together so they can then have it rejected? Right. Not because they're a terrorist, but just because they got it rejected yeah. for whatever reason. And this is really a case, one of those cases, too, where the government comes along breaks your legs and says we can really help you with that yeah you know no, it's you the same need thing. us the whole reason why we the need government i'm sorry to, we're talking about visas yes How, okay so why the whole reason talking why we would legs? need this visa review in the first place is because we've been bombing the middle east since the 1960s that's not the yeah. only reason we need the visa that's review. one big reason there that's weren't even passports before world war ii yeah uh-huh. people the reason why people want to come and kill americans is because we've been killing their families for over 50 years but the terrorism isn't the only reason why we need to be controlling the borders. I think it's the, the reason that most people would cite about the borders. Besides, I don't think that besides it is. Besides drug gang violence, which is yeah. also, again, the government breaking people's legs and then coming in to say that they can fix the problem. Right, that's drug prohibition leads to gang violence. So what's there the other issue the drug- that is yeah. – uh, what's the fear, fear-mongering, fear you know, the other issue that people need to be afraid of with the border? Well, I wouldn't call it fear-mongering. It's just the fact that we would – there would just be too many people coming into the United States – the population to would increase too quickly. Because of According welfare, to the another government poll. problem where they break your legs and then tell you they can fix it? Uh, okay, well, they're not breaking anybody's legs. So it, it's the Gallup poll yeah. Yeah, said that there was um, a study done around the world of if people could move to the United States, would mm-hmm. they? And 158 million people said that they would come to the United States. we got plenty States. of room. We don't have the infrastructure for that many that people. That gets built when people show up. Yeah. Overnight? It jobs. won't be overnight. 
No, it won't be overnight. Right. It would take a long time. We haven't built yeah. the infrastructure for people the people that we have. We have lots more people to build infrastructure as they came in and, right. oh, they get yeah. a job building the market, infrastructure. So the market's gonna, an amazing thing. Like, you yeah, either yeah. believe in the, the market and freedom or you don't. And you think that there needs to be control and some bureaucracy to tell everybody what to do. And it sounds like you believe in the latter. For infrastructure, for things like bridges and dams and levees, it's going to have to be the government. I really? don't think it's practical. Is it for the, the government that builds that. the bridges? No, it's not. It's private companies they that hire build bridges. Contractors, but it, they have to get the taxpayer money. Don't they? Don't they're not. If somebody wants to get somewhere. Then somebody will figure out a way to get there. Maybe it'll be the companies on one side of the road versus the other ones. You know, the companies want to have the bridge built so they can get customers over to where it is that they are. There's I mean, a lot of places where bridges are not cost effective. Mm-hmm. Then maybe they shouldn't be built. Then you just wouldn't have people living out there. Right. Okay. Well, it's going to be why more should of a we problem. subsidize? Sorry, sorry. Why should we subsidize a bunch of rich people to live out in the middle of nowhere by paying for their bridges for them? Why shouldn't they have to pay for their own bridge? we got more coming up here. Mike, I'm sorry we've been dominating the conversation. I'll, we'll try to bring you back in here in a moment. Stand by if you want. Uh, toll-free number here is 855-450-FREE. That's 855-450-3733. There's nothing the government does today that couldn't be done more effectively by open competition in a free marketplace, in my opinion. Uh, there's more on the way, though. You can take control and bring up what you want here on Free Talk Live. This is Free Talk Live. Toll free number here is 855 450 free. 855 450 3733. When things are getting heated here in the studio, uh, <laughs> Ian and Johnson, on the side of uh, immigration freedom, the side of uh, we don't need the government to build bridges. Uh, basically the voluntarist uh, viewpoint. And then, Laurel, you're kind of taking, uh, I don't know, a small government uh, view? <laughs> yes. Okay. So you think the government ought to do uh, border patrol? Uh, checking visas and things like that and building bridges and what police courts that kind of thing is that kind of your your gig yeah government? the government should keep us safe as much as possible which they have with, no obligation to do with the, which they have an obligation to do no obligation no obligation Correct. i think that that's right. one of the main purposes well my son says that the purpose supreme court disagrees with you my son says that the purpose of government is to fund the military that that's the reason government exists but anyway, I think, in my opinion, that the government should do as little as possible, but I do think that we need it, and infrastructure is one of the things well, that I think we need it for. Those things go hand in hand, that infrastructure and that military thing, because most people think that you have an obligation as a citizen to uh, you know pay for those things to get built, right? Like the services, the infrastructure, uh-huh. you know, those things, in order to have the government protect you. But the Supreme Court has stated that the government has neither the obligation to build those things nor the obligation to protect you. The government just exists to take your money. That's all they do, and that's the only thing that they're obligated to do is to steal from you. Well, they they will uh, do a bridge, you know, to show that they, they're yeah, sure. you know they're. You need to give them money. They're useful. But they don't have right? to do that. Right. Uh, and they don't have to protect you if you're being attacked or murdered or whatever. The police don't show up. You can't sue them. There's no obligation for them to protect you. You are you're familiar with those Supreme Court decisions, right? No, actually, I'm not. No, I uh, got to see in common law, common okay. law, constitutional law. Check out um, the Google the terms no obligation to protect and you'll come up with Warren versus District of Columbia and multiple other cases. It's not just one case that's been done on a multitude of occasions at various different levels, including the Supreme Court, where they basically um, have ruled very crystal clear that we have no obligation to protect you at all. Um, the only time the government has an obligation to protect you is when you are its ward. So there is so that's the one exemption. If so you're in prison. If you're in prison. Right. So mm-hmm. if you are. In their facility, they then have an obligation purportedly. And nobody ever dies in prison because of (laughs) neglect or mistreatment. Uh They do (laughs) such a great job. Let's go back to Mike in uh, Wisconsin. So, Mike, you've heard kind of two different sides here on this issue. Are you you finding yourself more aligning with Laurel, with this, you know, central state that purportedly is going to be small, but, you know, states don't tend to stay small in uh, in our experience? Or the, uh, the other side of let's let the market take care of it, just sort of this generic answer that us libertarians tend to you know to use is, oh, let the market take care of it uh, what do you think mike um I'm, I'm i'm starting to become more convinced that we should just relocate all the prisons to make the border wall <laughs> Wait, you, you mean funny. build it with prison labor no just build no, it with just prison. have it be a long just prison have a whole like that's oh. the entire border i love it because because then 
Well, at least something, because they're, you know, uh, otherwise, uh, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, then the prisons would be able to get their right. drugs a lot easier. <laughs> that, that's true. That's true. I mean, it's not like they're having a difficult time as is it's getting true. their drugs. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like I, um, you know, I, I, I called this in as, base, as a basic thought experiment because, you know, I, I do I do tend to side with you and Johnson on this issue. Mm -hmm. But I also know that, you know, like like when you look at Europe, like we've we've, we've turned Syria into a crater and, and look at the results of what they're having to deal with over in Europe with the refugee crisis and mm -hmm. just the, the spike in violent crime. And, and, and I, I've caught myself kind of looking at both going like, I mean, obviously the, the, the bulk of the crime. Oh, wait, wait, you mean border, Europe where you're not allowed to defend yourself? That place? Can't have a gun? Too. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. They're, they're, yeah. they're, like, these are all important things to discuss. Um, but, you know, uh, it, it's just, you know, it's like, after I, you know, I, I read about this, you know, spike in violent crime. Now, and again, granted, like if we wanted to end a lot of the southern border violence, we would just end the war on drugs. Period. Done. It's, yep. it's, and, and most of it would be gone. And then we have overnight. Then we could focus on, yeah, yeah. And then we could focus on more important things, which would be like, you know, m uh, malicious actors trying to permeate over the border. But right now, it's all such a nasty conflagration of of both of them that you can't quite tell. Mm -hmm. And and I, I call this in as kind of a thought experiment just to get people, get you, get you all talking and get, you know, uh, just to kind of hear people's thoughts on it. And Well, you called uh, on the right night. <laughs> <laughs> I also think that if there are a massive influx of people that you can't be sure that they're all going to be libertarians and they're mm. more likely to vote against you. And I think that's something that should sure. be considered. Well, well, and, and that's, you know, like when, when the whole, you know, caravan was kind of marching through, uh, you know, Central America. This is kind of one of the thoughts that came through my head is on one level, I'm just kind of like, well, if we just ended the drug war, everything, you know, mostly like if, if, if we stopped ruining and overthrowing governments in Central and South America, a lot of this wouldn't be our problem. But because we are the meddling nation that we are, um, it kind of becomes to a certain extent the government's problem, this government's problem. And how do you balance, you know, effective blowback from or the government's stupid decisions versus the, the the lives of the people that are kind of unfortunately in the way. Well, what you do and is, in my opinion, you don't punish people here for the stupid decisions of the government, which is what the people who you know support border controls and you know internal checkpoints and searches and all these things that they supposedly need to do to protect us. Uh, when the reality is they're just taking away our freedoms by doing all of those things. So to me, the most moral approach, if you're going to have a government, and that's not a moral thing to do if it's a coercive uh, agency of monopolistic force, uh, the most moral thing to do is to withdraw the United States military from every military base that they currently occupy around the world and make, a, make some sort of statement like, hey – we screwed up. We're sorry. We're going to leave now, and we're going to keep our military back in the United States. We're no longer going to be bombing anybody around the world, so sorry about that. We're just going to stop now. Um, and that's not going to necessarily end all the consequences immediately from what the government has already done in other people's lives. But at the very least, it will signal that things will change for the future. And that, I think, will reduce any chances. Because, by the way, I mean, despite all of the murders that the government in the United States has committed, uh, the killings of innocents around the, around the Middle East and elsewhere in the world, there's been a surprising lack of uh, terror strikes in the U.S. Yeah, the FBI can find some kind of patsy every now and then that they basically managed to convince to commit a terrorist act, which they otherwise probably wouldn't have done on their own. But actual, real, legitimate terror attacks in the United States, there's surprisingly few of them, considering the amount of just carnage uh, that the U.S. federal government has implemented around the globe. So I would say end the military occupation, go ahead and end the war on drugs while you're at it for good measure, and then you're basically going to solve two major problems with threats of violence and terror against Americans overnight. I'm with you on those things. Programs? 
What about welfare? Yeah. What, what about do you mean? The social safety nets. Well, yeah. I mean, because should... then if we, if we don't want those things, then people are going to come here. There's going to be too many people. No, I agree be, with you. The, you know? Those <laughs> things need to be ended too. But it seemed that the conversation was more about the terrorists coming here mm-hmm. rather than the yeah. welfare recipients coming here because there's two types of scary stories about people coming across the border there's the dangerous killers, and then there's the people that just want to take welfare. We don't want any of them. Don't forget the dirty right? and the disease. Mike, good call tonight. Thanks for sharing. But oh, that's the other one. Yeah, they're, they're going to bring leprosy or they're going to bring tuberculosis or whatever. Which they do. Um, yes, again, still not worried. <laughs> not not an excuse to create a, a big government bureaucracy and infringe upon people's freedoms. Uh, let the market handle it. We can continue here in moments. It's Free Talk Live. Does your dog itch, scratch, stink, or shed like crazy? Come to Dynavite for help. Order a 90-day supply of Dynavite. Everything we tried failed except the Dynavite. Pick up two bottles of Super Mega Fish Oil. Get the third bottle free. Packed with Omega-3, DHA, and EPA fatty acids. Super Mega is great for your dog's immune system, healthy skin, and soft, shiny fur. Dogs love it. Try Super Omega Fish Oil. Buy two. Get one free. At Dynavite.com. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. This is Free Talk Live. You can bring up whatever you want here. The toll-free number is 855-450-FREE. That's 855-450-3733. We do have the Discord on our call-in line rooms over at discord.lrn.fm. With you in the studio tonight, it's Ian. And Johnson. I'm Laurel. So we're going to continue with more of your calls and thoughts. Then coming up, jobs that suck. Uh, why is it that according to Reason.com, they ask, why do so many modern jobs seem pointless? we got that story. Johnson's got it ready to go. But first, Sarah is on the line in New Mexico. Sarah, you're on Free Talk Live. Go ahead. Yes, uh, just in the month of January, um, our city, we issued out like 400 speeding tickets. 400, just in one month. Wow. And, See, uh, speeding tickets obviously stop people from speed. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Sarah. Well, the thing is, is that, you know, the our mayor, he's, he's very hip. You know, oh, yeah? that, um, when you do. Did you say he have a boombox? No, she said hip. Oh. Does he have tattoos? Oh, he's got sideburns. Yeah, <laughs> okay. All right, I'll give you that one. He's a, so is he a hipster? No, he's very hip to the idea that it, the traffic stop, it reduces crime overall in general. Uh, I don't think that's the, true. The, What's you, you mean because they're running warrant checks on, on people? I mean, they have found, they have done a study in like Texas and other places. What they have done is that they do traffic stops, the burglaries and the robberies, it all goes down like by 60 to 90 percent. That but, sounds but they unbelievable. Actual, they should I mean, just I, stop I, I everybody. Know, but... <laughs> well, isn't that what you want, Laurel? <laughs> no. For immigration checks and such? Only along the border, not uh... everywhere. Which is kind of funny because, uh, you know, the actual the traffic crime, the speeding, the traffic violation only goes by 5%. It's a very – the traffic itself is uh, – makes hardly any change. But the robberies, the burglaries, the home break, break-ins, and the auto theft, it goes down by 60%, which is – Well, okay. Kind of, but correlation like, isn't I'm, necessarily I'm, causation. So just because um... – you know, somebody's getting more speeding tickets or the government's giving out more speeding tickets and uh, crime against properties go down, that doesn't necessarily mean that the speeding tickets have anything to do or traffic stops have anything to do with crime going down. You know what would be interesting? I've never looked for this. I wonder if there's a study on whether there's a correlation between traffic tickets and criminal activity. Do people who commit crimes, do they get more traffic tickets? I wonder. Uh, that's a good question. Um, or are the people who are committing crimes more careful and get less and get fewer I don't know. Uh, traffic tickets? Thanks for the call tonight, Sarah. I appreciate it. Let's go to Gene, the Christian anarchist. He's calling from Tennessee on our Discord lines. Go ahead, Gene. Hello, y'all. Hey. And, uh, I was going to call and talk about the 60s, but since Laurel decided that she supports... Um, the uh, the state in the in the way that she said that the biggest concern 
being terrorism. I well, that's not my biggest concern. Change. Well, a big concern is terrorism. Okay. A major concern. And I wanted to pipe in on that. Because All right, go ahead. I have, uh, for over 20 years now, I've been telling people there are no terrorists in this country. Because believe it or not, 20 years ago, they were saying the same darn thing. Oh, terrorism, terrorism, terrorism. Yep. And they were all concerned about terrorism. And yep. I called the talk show 20 years ago. Marty had to get to DeLorean up to 88 miles per hour before, uh, you know, the <laughs> yeah. terrorists shot Doc in the van. Well, 20 yeah. years and ago, I mean, so 9-11 was 18 years even, ago. Yeah, almost 20 Didn't even happen so. yet. Hadn't even happened. But, it was but I called the talk show 20 years ago because they were talking about terrorism. I said, look. The biggest threat to freedom is not halfway across the planet. It's right there in Washington, D.C. Mm. I said, you want to worry about terrorism? There it is. But if there were terrorists in this country to any great number at all, and I'm not saying there's zero, there might be a couple here. You mean there, except for the right? government, right? You're talking about terrorists who aren't the government. Right. Okay. Other, other than the terrorist government. Right. If there were any terrorists, most of them don't have the means. And any any successful terrorism requires two things. It requires the means and it requires the desire. Now, a lot of people have zero means and a lot of desire. And some people have a lot of means, but they don't, uh, you know, they, they, some, the people that have the money. All it takes is a car and things, you run the car into a crowd, which has happened several uh, times. Right which is an argument that I use to show people that there aren't any terrorists here. That's right. Because if they were, because the government's doing a good job of here, not no. getting the visas. <laughs> no, that's no. Not it. If, they found if terrorists were here in any numbers, you would hear of trucks running through crowds. You would hear of school buses exploding. But Gene, what you she just hear... said was it's because the government is stopping them from coming here. Did you hear that? Uh, well, she it, can it's... make that conclusion if she wants, but the borders but this, are wide open. The same person who They're... said earlier in this show that the border is highly porous has also said that they're doing a great job <laughs> stopping criminals who don't right. care about submitting visas. I don't so, think that most of them are trying to come through Mexico, although some of them have been caught doing why not? it that way. Because they're too stupid. If it's that easy, what? why not? Yeah, why yeah, would you so sign you up for a visa? Call. You can't. You can't have it both ways. I mean, there are no terrorists in this country because there are no attacks happening. Right. And the borders are porous, so therefore the government is not saving you. Well, there was the Boston bombing. That's been a, it's been a while, but there was that one. It's been a while. And most of the time when, they, when the government says that they have saved us from some horrible terrorist attack that they managed to stop, usually it's some mentally challenged individuals who had zero means right. but they were angry at everybody so the government the fbi comes in there and they work these guys up into a big old lather and then they give them a truck with fake bombs in it and they say drive it over there and push this button and then they rush in and rescue everybody from yep. the fake bombs that the fbi provided right. they re they rescue also, everyone from the terrorists they created also the uh, zarnev correct. brothers didn't the cross who? any the zarnev brothers from oh, the marathon, oh, right. boston mm -hmm. marathon bombings didn't cross any borders because they were united states citizens were they yeah okay i thought they were immigrants but... they they were immigrants but they so immigrated as they immigrated right. as young children i see uh, but I, your risk of okay. ever being hurt by a terrorist is close to zero your risk to being hurt by the government is a hundred times greater. In yep. fact, the problem, I would say 10,000 times greater than being hurt by a terrorist. I totally agree, which is why Laurel's solution of having the government, uh, you know, exist to control these things puts us all in greater danger because they're the ones who are destroying freedom. They're the ones who are putting innocent people behind bars and uh, you know, they're much more the concerned. Government, I, I do agree that looking, well. I do agree that there is a danger I, you know, I acknowledge this, that the government uses this security threat to um, infringe too far on people's rights. And I think that happened in the Bush administration and has been continuing on sure. till today. So I the do agree with you The government does there. nothing well. And there was a call a right. few months back where an old lady had called in supporting her government and Ian had me come on. And I put one question to her and I said, Get, tell me one program that the government does well. And she couldn't do it. And I I asked that question to a lot of people. I think the post office has people, done really well. And <laughs> they're I know losing money. Like, 
hand over fist, they're losing billions of dollars. Are and they? I and thought they're they even were quasi funded. private. All right, I'm going to okay. check that one out. No, they're not self funded. They are partially self funded. <laughs> the government continues to shore up their retirement funds, for instance. That's uh-huh. one of the things that they do. And they have to go to the government every time they want to change their business model. So the Postal Service isn't as independent as they want you to believe, right? Mm-hmm. They want you to think they're like some private agency. But the reality is, if they want to stop delivering mail, say two days a week or three days a week or something like that, or they want to raise rates or they want to do whatever it is they want to do to change how they do business, they pretty much have to go to Congress to get it approved first. Yeah, but the fact of the matter is, if I send a letter someplace, it's really cheap for me to send it. It's cheaper than any of the courier services, and it gets there pretty quickly. The only time I'm going to have Alexander to use... Spooner tried to, tried to compete with the post office, and they made it illegal for him to do so. Yeah, that's absolutely true. They actually outlawed... It's still illegal to deliver mail for less than a dollar, so nobody can even could compete with them, even if they wanted to. And again, they're losing... Go look it up. It's billions of dollars every single year. Uh, more coming up here in moments. This is Free Talk Live. It's Free Talk Live. You dial toll-free to join us here if you want our toll-free number is 855-450-FREE. That's 855-450-3733. Also, Free Talk Live brought to you by Bitcoin.com, your premier source for everything Bitcoin-related. They can help you choose a Bitcoin wallet, buy Bitcoin, and show you where you can spend your Bitcoin. But more importantly, to my mind, for the newbie, is they've got the Bitcoin.com Academy, so you can actually learn about what is Bitcoin and why is it so important? Why is it so popular? Why is it the most important thing that has happened to money in multiple generations, multiple lifetimes? Uh, Go to Bitcoin.com and get started over there. If you're not new to Bitcoin, they've got useful features for you too, like the latest news headlines over at news.bitcoin.com. Or you can engage with the community on their Bitcoin forum. Go to Bitcoin.com. So we go back to... I thought we still had Gene, but I guess he was done. Uh, Gene, the Christian anarchist there in our Discord server. Hey, you want to talk to Gene? You can actually do that on your own time. Uh, You can go to our Discord server. He's frequently hanging out in there during the live show, sometimes before, sometimes after. Uh, So the Discord server allows you to interact with other Free Talk Live listeners. uh, And it's free. So head over to discord.lrn.fm. You can do that. Let's talk to Vernon in New Orleans. Vernon, you're on Free Talk Live with Ian Johnson and Laurel. I try to be a neutral party, and I'm really all about the facts. So, in your previous segment, you were mentioning that the post office is um, is sort of supported by federal funding. Yes. Um, and I just wanted to clarify that, um, from what I've read and what I understand, and I have no ties to the post office, and I agree with you that as far as it, you know, being need necessary for today's, uh, you know, using email and everything, it's not necessary minus packages, but um, it it it's required to be funded they had to fund their pension plans at least 10 years in advance Mm -hmm. which really takes away from their their ability to be profitable if you actually look at the numbers and if they weren't required to pre-fund their pension plan so far in advance the the post office is actually supposedly profitable but and and also i wanted to clarify that that according again to what I've read, mm. they don't receive a dime from the federal government. And but yes, they do have to run all their stuff through the federal government, the Congress, just like any other federal in, in, uh, entity does. But as far as being funded, like from a general fund or whatever, I from what I understand, that's not true. Yeah, no, I wasn't saying they're funded uh, from the general fund. What I was saying was they are using federal money to shore up their pension funds because they don't have enough don't money to do it. I think they're doing that. I think I, I think they've only used the profits like from selling stamps and from selling other things to to pay all of that. They just have to pay so much of the profit up front to shore up that pension plan, which is really not shoring it up. It's simply making sure that it's funded at least ten years in advance, which no other. No other federal agency is required to do that, and so by them being required to do that, it it, sh- it always makes them look as though they're unprofitable, which I find mm-hmm. interesting that the, that the U.S. Congress would have enacted some sort of a law that, that requires the post office to pre-fund their pension plan so far in advance to kind of give it that look as though it's impro- you know, not profitable. I don't know. Well, the reality is, I mean, okay, let's take what you're saying and presume that it's true, that if it weren't for these mandates put on them by the government, that they would be profitable. The reality is 
mail volume as far as actual first class mail has been going down year after year. So they've got a huge problem that's only going to continue getting worse they over do, time. But the, but the package delivery business has skyrocketed. And I don't know if you've ever seen one of those little post office vans going around mm-hmm. on a Sunday. Yep. I mean, I have never seen that until Amazon actually contracted with them to start doing, uh, you know, the final mile delivery. Yep. And and I mean, I've, and I've even read articles where these postal employees are complaining that they have to work on a Sunday because, you know, and the post office is making them because they're so worried about profitability. Because just like TVA, they don't get any sort of government funding. And if they don't get those profits, then, you know, they, they, they're not – from what I understand, I don't think they've ever gotten a bailout from the federal government. And so if they lose profitability, then, of course, they're going to have to cut employees and everything. I don't know – if that's ever happened or not, but you know, I, I really do think that that even though letter volume is down, that you know, because I I don't know about you all, but I rely on the post office for the last mile delivery of most of my packages. Well, can that you order imagine? Online. Can you imagine what would happen if they removed the laws that prohibited other shipping services from delivering to residential and business mailboxes? What like, other what other laws? UPS and FedEx can deliver just as the same as you. UPS they cannot can. deliver to your mailbox. They cannot. You yeah, but they just go right up to your not house. To your it's not a big what do you mean deal. Mailbox? Your front what, do you, door. what do you mean by your mailbox? Like a mailbox. Like if you have a mailbox, they can't touch it. Oh, right. oh, but yeah, but mostly you can't put packages in there anyway. They're too small. Depends for on the, the most part. Yeah, but you're right. You but can't you put, put anything a notification in there. Notification for it's, a package. It's a federal know, crime, is what yeah. you're saying, to put something that's not mail from the postal service in a mailbox. Right. Yeah, yeah but then you just deliver there, directly there is, to the house. I don't think which it's an issue. And it's a huge issue. Why is it? And a that's huge why issue? they're coming up with services like Amazon Key and all that stuff. Because in uh, cities, especially in urban areas, there is no front door place to put it without that package possibly I or even probably getting it. stolen. I read an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal just a couple of days ago that the post office is actually looking at allowing other companies to to pay a fee to be able to put whatever they'd like in that mailbox. So that <laughs> wow, how magnanimous of them. I know, right? Look, Go to Google News and look it up. It, it, it's very interesting. But in, in general, I mean, I know you all, you know, the theme of the show a lot of the time is, all government is evil. All government is bad. Yeah, it's just I don't yeah. violence. It's because it's, just... it's backed by violence. If it weren't backed by violence, if it weren't backed, backed by, by aggression, violence. then it wouldn't be a problem. Yeah. And if you want to cut the post, office, the post office, is, the post not, office backed is not backed by violence. violence. He's. I agree with him. Well, well I don't know, man. There are, dude, it's a law. There are. Look up the PES yeah. laws. Just look up for Wikipedia PES laws. Any law is a threat at the barrel of a gun that if you do not comply, people who are armed will come and tell you what to do. Right. If you don't abide by what they tell you to do, they shoot you or they lock you in a cage. And if you refuse to be locked in the cage, they shoot you. Even though they may not be mostly funded by violence, if what you're saying is true, Vernon, that they're not actually getting uh, payments from the the taxpayers for the for their pensions, which is maybe, I, I swear I'd heard they were in the past, but maybe they're not anymore. I don't know. But uh, even if that's true, there's still these laws that essentially enshrine the Postal Service as the monopoly dealer of certain delivery services. So again, it's illegal for you to create a competitor to the Postal Service. So therefore, they have a monopoly. It's not a disagreement. It's illegal for you to deliver mail that's under a dollar in value. Like well, no, I could go to. I, I don't know about that. I, I I can't comment on that. Well, you I'm can telling you, now. I'm telling you, it's illegal. <laughs> That's why they went after but, but, Lysander Spooner in the 1800s well, then for that. Why aren't there more services saying you can send a letter for a dollar? Well, because why would you want to? Why would you even want to bother with that? Well, why do How people use? You could, why, why would you people compete use with FedEx Ground? Huh? And they pay. Why do people use FedEx Ground to to send mail? And it's like fifteen dollars. Like, why does FedEx Ground exist? It takes three days. You FedEx just, Ground? You mean for packages? For to send a letter. Very few people use letter. FedEx to send a letter unless they need something delivered quickly. Typically. Well, then why uh, does it exist? Overnight, for instance. Why would they even have it? Which they do. Why do they have a ground service? What, FedEx. Well, when it's you're for sending packages, a letter, mostly. 
Right, but UPS and FedEx, you can send something and, and not overnight it. It'll take a couple of days. That's that's true. Uh-huh. Um, generally, that's a package service. Um, most people who are sending letters, if they if they need to get it somewhere soon, they're going to do it overnight, okay, or the oh, next day or something just, like that. Also, file, FedEx and the... UPS will act as couriers. So, like, for example, if you're delivering it to an office, FedEx and UPS will walk into that office, uh-huh. go up to a desk and hand it to someone and, put, you know, potentially get it signed for, right. whereas the post office just threw in a box. It's also insured <laughs> as well. If you want it to be insured with uh, UPS and uh, FedEx, you don't insure first class mail, for instance. That's just not an option. So it's a much more higher level. Like if you're gonna if you're gonna have legal papers signed, you don't want to just put that in an envelope and throw it in you know first class no, mail. No, I, I send it right? via um, priority mail. Uh, which has a tracking information and it costs about seven dollars and it's insured automatically for fifty dollars. Now get they it. finally have yeah. that uh, <laughs> after years of uh-huh. the UPS and FedEx having trackable insured mail. Priority Mail finally got it after like another fifteen years later. Now I will say that if I absolutely have to get something in overnight, like if I have an appeal that has a yep. very hard deadline, I have to FedEx it because USPS isn't reliable enough. If for you overnight. walk into USPS, they hire FedEx to do that work. From what I understand, that's <laughs> true. Yeah. Just, just, a, just a final thought. One of the other innovations that I, I think the post office is starting to come into the 21st century. I, I, I have this email that comes to me on a daily basis that shows me scanned images of everything that I'm expecting yeah, in the mail. Creepy. Which is very nice, and <laughs> it also is able to sync up to all my packages. I know it's like I know this is like 1990 technology, but they're, I think they're doing their absolute best in the confines. Of the regular, oh, yeah, there's no doubt. They are doing their absolute best in the confines, and that means they're losing $3.9 billion. Thank you for the call tonight. Uh, in the last fiscal year, according to CNN Politics. I wonder what Edward Snowden would say about that metadata the government is being handed by scanning every single yeah. letter. Yeah, more on the way here. Toll-free numbers 855-453-free. One benefit of the Postal Service is that uh, they do ostensibly need a warrant to open your mail, unlike UPS and FedEx. Not to scan the outside. That's true. More coming up. This is Free Talk Live. Hour 3 is next. Do you operate a retail business and are looking for a solution for point-of-sale cryptocurrency acceptance? It's never been easier thanks to AnyPay.Global. There's no paperwork or approval process to open an account. If you already have a tablet at your cash register, you're almost done. Just sign up at AnyPay.Global, drop your personal crypto wallet addresses in our setup page, and then load our app. That's it. You're accepting cryptocurrency like Bitcoin and Dash at your store. Get started now at AnyPay.Global. That's AnyPay.Global. It's Free Talk Live. We're launching into the third hour of the program. Toll-free number is 855-450-FREE, like freedom. That's 855-450-3733. There's no doubt that the Postal Service is one of the least offensive government agencies because it is as disconnected from the government's funding sources uh, as it can possibly be compared to most government agencies. Although that said... It's not entirely disconnected. And Johnson, you've got a story that you found you wanted to share. For those of you just tuning in, this is what we've been talking about. Uh, Ian Johnson and Laurel in the studio tonight. Phones are open for you if you want to join us here. And then if we get the chance, we'll talk about uh, pointless jobs. Because there is a point to the Postal Service. People are going to, in the in the absence of government monopoly, people are still going to want to send things through the mail, whatever that would look like in some sort of you know market-based system where we actually have true competition in these areas. We already pointed out the fact that they have a protection racket uh, in place, a law that actually prevents uh, you know private company, FedEx or UPS or some company that you might start. Uh, from competing with the Postal Service for what's called first-class mail, basically. Anything uh, that's under a dollar is uh, considered that. And, of course, th- that's you brought up a good point, Johnson, and that is that once the, the price of a stamp goes over a dollar, what's going to, you know, what's going to happen? Are they going to adjust the law to make it so first-class is anything mm-hmm. under $2 to keep the protection racket going uh, or what? But that's not all. There's uh, several, what, $18 billion per year worth of uh, subsidies in various different ways they receive? So, yeah, let me go into this, this article. It's a little old, but I, I think it uh, covers some interesting It's just facts. a few years yeah, old. It's so, still true. Yep. So uh, it says here, the United States Postal Service's financial troubles have been well publicized in recent years. The worst of it came in 2012 when the USPS lost a whopping 
$15.9 billion, Woof. followed by $4.8 billion and then $5.3 billion in 2013 and 2014. How do you do that without being subsidized? Yeah. You know, but also, that's one of the things I want to know is like if you're running a business and you're losing billions of dollars every single year, your your venture capitalists are going to dry up. Right? right. Like they're going to be like, uh, yeah, you need to change how you're doing your business or we're not going to keep giving you money. But these guys just keep year after year. It's 15 billion here. Three point nine. They lost in 2018. Right. And yeah. According to and Right. According yeah. to uh, CNN politics, so uh, fiscal year money. 2018, they lost three point nine billion dollars. So it's just like, well, that's not a business. Okay. By no means, in any way, shape, or form, is that a business. Well, post office officials have often attributed the losses to the decline in demand for first class mail in favor of more efficient modes of communication, like email. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And congressional mandates that you and congressional mandates that the USPS do things like deliver mail on Saturdays, and to and to unprofitable parts of the country. Mm-hmm. In fact, the USPS claims that if it weren't for such requirements. It would make it would more or less break even if we only didn't have to deliver the mail. So, you know, like any other business would. Um, So it says Robert Shapiro, former Treasury undersecretary and chairman of the economic consultancy Sonicon, points out in a new analysis, American taxpayers subsidize the USPS at a rate that surpasses the costs associated with any congressional mandate. He estimates that all told, the subsidies and legal monopolies that Congress bestows upon the post office is worth around $18 billion annually. This was in 2015. Mm -hmm. Um, These include... Laws that bar any other shipping service from delivering mail and packages that directly to residential and business mailboxes. This is what I mentioned uh, a little bit ago. Uh, Shapiro estimates that his this gives the post office a fourteen billion dollar annual boost, more than three times what postal regulatory regulatory commission estimates it to be. Hmm. Shapiro argues that the PRC's analysis doesn't take into account the productivity gains that the post office would be forced to make if it really had to compete for mailbox delivery. He points out that the productivity at USPS has only grown by 0.7% per year versus 2.5% for its competition. Hmm. Tax breaks. The post office this is, is a biggie. Yeah, huge. Yeah. The post office is exempt from state and local property and real estate taxes. <laughs> huge. Which is that a is tremendous cost, uh, especially here in New Hampshire, where that is the essentially how the state's funded is through the property tax. Oh, but let's not forget other burdens like tolls, vehicle registration fees, parking tickets. Those exemptions save the USPS $2.18 billion a year. Mm. So, I mean, imagine if, you know, FedEx and, uh, you know, U- UPS had those. Right. UPS drivers papers. are paying tickets all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just part of like in in uh, New York City, they're breaking constantly breaking traffic laws because there's nowhere to park or whatever. So they're just leaving a leaving the truck running while they go in and they're just occupying a lane of traffic or whatever it is they got to do. And, and they then they come out fuel for that entire time, burning too. fuel. And then also they get tickets all the time. It's just like it eh, cost of doing business. It's just the way we got to do it because we can't drive around and, and find a parking get spot. Even more tickets in places that are making laws that you can't idle a vehicle. Right. <laughs> so. um this one's one probably people don't think of. Cheap borrowing. The United mm. States Postal Service, writes Shapiro, can borrow from the U.S. Treasury through the Federal Financing okay. Bank that at explains highly it. subsidized interest rates. Yeah, so that explains it. Because I'm, I'm thinking to myself here, you know, when the guy called in and was saying, oh, well, they, the Postal Service isn't taxpayer funded, meaning that not only are they not funding their operations, but they're also not funding their uh, or not shoring up their retirement scheme, which is what I thought was, was going mm-hmm. on. So I'm like, well, okay, well, how Where's do you Where's the money coming losing? from? Yeah, I mean, you can't just keep losing billions of dollars a year because you don't have that sitting in the bank. You're losing it. I mean, they don't have a hundred million or a hundred billion dollars just sitting in the bank to just keep funding these losses. So what you're saying yeah. is they're getting loans from was it the Federal Reserve? Yeah. Federal uh, Financing Bank. Okay, it's probably some sort so of how they can go on to say how anyone can say that they're not using federal dollars. Yes, yeah, it's clear they're only operating on. You know their profits, so they're uh, taking loans. No. So if they're, they're ta- losing money, then all the money that they're yeah. taking in loan is at the cost to the taxpayer. Right. 
Right, right. So every year, uh, yeah. every year they keep taking it, just keep adding it up, right? Because they're not paying it off. There hasn't been a year in oh, the last 20 years or whatever. somewhere in the vicinity of like $45 billion. The total, total amount like, of losses? It's, it's probably And if they're still that, operating right. at a loss every year, basically they're never going to pay the money back. They'll never pay oh, the yeah. loan back, which means that whenever it is this all comes to a head, whenever that is, because again, there's no restrictions probably on the, how, mu- how much of these loans they can pull. Really? It currently yeah. borrows the legal limit of $15.2 billion at a rate of 1.2%. Without this access, it would be paying somewhere between $415 million and $419 million per year more in interest. If it were bought, if it were getting uh if it didn't have the special deal yeah. is what you're saying. If they were getting a commercial yeah. loan. Yeah. yeah. Finally, and who the hell would give them a loan? Yeah. This is a guarantee, right? Yeah, like they can just keep going loss. back to the yeah. trough. Yeah. Okay. I wish I could do that. Like yeah. why would anyone, any banker give these people a loan? Uh-huh. I mean, you're looking at their 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 business numbers here. You're looking over the last 20 years and you're like, "Okay, your revenue keeps dropping. Yeah, your packages are up, but you continue to drop uh as far as, you know, how much business you're doing overall and you're not you're losing money hand over fist. Um y- you're not going to get bailed out, presumably. So why would we take a risk? Why would we take a risk giving you? You haven't made a, sim- a simple loan payment. This story here from CNN Politics says they just didn't pay the six six point nine billion in benefits prepayments in the last year. So they're supposed to be paying into well, the benefits. Like, the benefit fund. There's, there's another thing there that finally Shapiro points out that the USPS pays its workers' salaries and benefits far above rates paid to similar workers in the private sector. Labor accounted for 78% mm-hmm. of the organization's costs in 2014, with about 89% of those costs involving employees represented by collective bargaining. Unions. These higher labor costs, plus the absence of a need to innovate due to government-granted monopolies, yep. has freed the UPS from $20 billion in labor and production Activity costs per year, Shapiro estimates. While we do not technically count this as a subsidy, he writes, it represents an economic burden on others arising directly from USPS's monopoly position. Postage, for instance, would likely be a lot cheaper for everyone if the organization were subject to the same competitive pressures as private firms. Postal workers make very good salaries. They make forty to eighty-five thousand yeah. dollars a year. Sweet. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Toll free number tonight, 855-450 free. Uh, according to the Postal Service's own statement, they were, quote, unable to make the $6.9 billion in uh, payments that were due to the federal government at the end of fiscal year 2018 to pre-fund pension and health benefits for postal retirees without putting its ability to fulfill its primary mission at undue risk. They just didn't make the payments. So what's going to happen? Someone's going to. This is Free Talk Live. Dial toll free. Bring up whatever you want. Our number 855 450 free like freedom. That's 855 450 3733. You can bring up anything you want here on Free Talk Live. We've also got the Discord on air call in line rooms over at discord.lrn.fm with you tonight. It's Ian. And I'm Johnson. I'm Laurel. We've been looking at uh, the Postal Service and what the financial situation exactly is there. And Johnson, you'd answered a big question of mine that I had uh, without even me having to ask it. You pointed out that they have a special access to a special government bank Mm -hmm. and i forget what the name of it it wasn't the federal reserve it was a financing bank yeah so it's probably some bank that only does business with government agencies would be that's what it sounds like right um i doubt you can go in and open up an account at the federal financing bank um i want that billion dollar loan and they just keep on pumping money into the postal service this has been very illuminating because i used yeah. to think of the post office until tonight as, as an the, efficient government as the agency. example of the government agency that works so and, now- and it's and you know to the post office's credit the ceo right now their postmaster general megan brennan uh this is the, the story from cnn politics she said that quote the flawed business model imposed by law continues to be the root cause of our financial instability they can't change their business model without going to Congress. So if they felt as though having three days of delivery instead of six would benefit them because they could cut you know, staff and costs and mm-hmm. whatever and only deliver the mail every other day, uh, then they can't just 
They can't just get the board of directors to, together and decide, let's do it. No, they've got to get the entire Congress, you know, to propose legislation and debate and vote. And then, you know, when's that going to happen? Has it happened recently? No. They've just been talking about it and talking about it. Uh, Brennan says, quote, we're seeking reforms that would allow the organization to reduce costs, grow revenue, compete more effectively and function with greater flexibility to adapt to the marketplace and invest in our future. That's all sounds great. Unfortunately, they have to wait until somebody bestows that upon them. They have to mm-hmm. wait until Congress allows them to do it. So honestly, the best thing that could happen to the post office is for them to no longer be an actual <laughs> government agency, to have no connection whatsoever. Let them either sink or swim in the real marketplace where they're not backed up by some elite bank that's just basically fleecing taxpayers. That, for that, that bank has 17 employees. <laughs> the federal uh, bank thing? The federal financing <gasps> bank was Created by Congress in 1973 and has 17 employees. You know what the funny thing, though, is that even even though private industries are a lot more efficient than the government industries, they also have a lot of fat that they need to cut. In fact, a lot of the jobs that people have over even in private industry seem pointless, don't they, Johnson? Good segue. In fact, that's the, uh, (laughs) the story that you brought in here tonight. And there's no doubt anybody who's worked for a big corporation knows this, right? You can see the waste in corporate America, Mm -hmm. but it's still at least those corporations are subject to competition and when a corporation fails, the only people who are on the hook for it are the investors. Mm-hmm. So it's their money that they lose, not you and I. We don't lose when – if Walmart goes out of business tomorrow, it'll be inconvenient because you might have to go to Target or somewhere other, you know, somewhere else to get your toothpaste or something like that. But you yourself will not lose because you weren't an investor in that company, unless you were, in which case – But you know. the big question is if if the private companies are trying so hard to make a profit and they're motivated by the market forces, why do they have so many jobs there that seem pointless? Well, um, I think that there is a a book there that is attempting to answer this question, uh, written by uh, a uh, David Graeber. And you can't say the name of the. I can't say book the name of the book, the but it's also the name of a show that we've talked about. Uh, you can say past. the name; you just can't say a certain word in it, right? Uh, I'll just call it BS. Yeah, BS jobs a theory. Um, so this. <laughs> <laughs> and this is like a summary piece or an excerpt? Well, uh, this is a, just an article about the, the same topic. Okay. Um, so, by the same guy. Yeah, by the same guy. Okay. I think. Wait. No. Wait. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not by the same guy. Um, it's it's talking about some of the stuff that's in the book, but it's an article of, in Reason.com. By, oh, you're right. Roderick by, Long wrote yeah, the article, yeah. but he's referencing this book. Correct. By David Graeber. Yeah. Okay. So he says, during the last century, everyone from John Maynard Keynes to the Jetsons predicted that in the future, technological advances would drastically cut down the number of hours the average person would need to work to keep the economy going. Why didn't that happen? In BS Jobs, David Graeber, an anthropologist at the London School of Economics, suggests it did happen. Not that people are working fewer hours, but that fewer of those hours are actually needed. Graeber argues that much, perhaps most, of the waged labor in the world's industrialized nations consists of BS jobs, jobs that are so completely pointless, unnecessary, or pernicious that even the employee cannot justify their existence. These are not to be confused with S jobs, and there's another fun word, uh, which are unpleasant and poorly paid, but often produce some obviously good, useful service. On the contrary, BS jobs may be well-paid and fairly easy, yet people nevertheless tend to find them extremely demoralizing, as evidenced by testimonials Graeber has collected from workers around the world. Contrary to the widespread widespread presumption that people seek maximum financial return for their minimum effort— Graeber finds that people will often quit a BS job for a lower paying and more labor intensive one if the latter offers a greater scope for meaningful personal agency. Which comes back around to what we talked about earlier Mm -hmm. in the show where people work not just because they get a paycheck, but because there's meaning to what they do because they're helping people, they're providing a service, they're providing a product, but not if it's a BS job. right? Right. If it's enough money, if you have a BS job, you want to throw my way? 
right? <laughs> well, this is this is part of the reason for the quote wage gap is that women are find it more important for them to have a meaningful job, and men find it more important to have a job that pays well. Hmm. I can find my meaning in other areas of my life if necessary. <laughs> <laughs> With enough money, you can find a whole lot of meaning. Um, anyway. <laughs> Many BS jobs exist only or primarily to make someone else look important or to solve problems arising from a fault in the organization or the damage done by a superior. Graver points to polls in which 37 to 40 percent of respondents felt their jobs made no meaningful contribution to the world. And that's tough. Yeah. Add the unneeded aspects of needed jobs and Graver estimates the total <laughs> Biasitization of the. <laughs> this is a hard one to read. This, yeah. this article <laughs> of the, mar- the job market at slightly over fifty percent. Okay, I want to jump in with this. Uh, a lot of these jobs exist only or primarily to make someone else look important. So I experienced this phenomena <laughs> as. You know, as an attorney, I, I used to have in my firm, I had uh, two or three attorneys working for me. I had a couple of paralegals and I had um, a few other assistants and an accountant. So I had, you know, a fairly large number of people working for me. And I discovered that the clients loved that I had all of these people working for me in my office, but they wanted me to personally handle the case. So basically, they wanted the show to see that I was important because I because I had all these, all people, these people working for me. Yeah. But then they wanted me to do the case because they wanted the important person on the case. Of course, the whole point of having the staff is Ex- so you can put tasks on the staff. Exactly, and exactly. Yeah. So I finally said, you know, I don't need all of these people because my clients won't let them do the work. Uh-huh. The clients <laughs> would always be bringing the questions to me. Right. And so I finally let everybody go, and I I work a lot less and make more money now. All right. There's more on the way here, and. You don't have to deal with the staffing issues. Exactly. And I don't have to deal with the drama. You're right. 855 450 free. We got more on the BS yeah. jobs coming up here. Your calls and thoughts. Maybe you have a BS job. You want to talk about it? You're welcome to join us on Free Talk Live, 855 450 free. That's 855 450 3733. Or join the Discord server, discord.lrn.fm. And it's Free Talk Live. Looking for a great real estate investment? Consider New Hampshire, which is ground zero for the Liberty Movement. Your first call should be to Mark Warden from Porcupine Real Estate. He's more than just a real estate agent. He's your New Hampshire concierge. Where are the best places to live? Do you want farm, city, the burbs, or forest? Do you want a duplex or multifamily building so that renters pay your mortgage? There are homes in all price ranges in New Hampshire, and Mark can help with financing, too. Invest in Liberty and property. Mark Warden can help. Porcupinerealestate.com. It is Free Talk Live. You can dial in toll free here, 855 450 free. Maybe you've got some downtime at your BS job and you want to talk about it on the air with us. You can. There's, according to this reason.com piece, Johnson, that you're sharing with us. 37 to 40 percent of respondents to a a survey, I'm not sure when it was conducted, uh, said that their jobs made, quote, no meaningful contribution to the world, uh, which is a pretty depressing statistic. Um, And of course, that's all subject to their opinion, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, some people might say it is meaningful to, uh, you know, to to plumb somebody's toilets. Others would say that it's not. Uh, so it just depends on who you ask in, in that particular. You know, there's probably also a ton of, you know, commie-like people out there who are serving people in business but feel like their job is meaningless because it's corporate. Right. They hate something. themselves for it, that kind of thing. Because mm-hmm. they're doing business and, well, and that's, evil, that's not contributing to, to the world because they should be, you know, I don't know. Writing or doing art or something. Speaking of uh, contributing, we have a way for you to contribute to the show, which is the Free Talk Live AMP program. It's amp.freetalklive.com. And thanks to Sean Sullivan, who is a silver amplifier, which means Sean is giving $5 a month to the AMP program, advertise, market, and promote. You can do it with a uh, credit card. You can do it with PayPal. You can do it with Bitcoin BTC. And you can all do, you can do it over from amp.freetalklive.com. It's super easy to get signed up. You get some perks, some benefits as a result of doing that. Uh, and please, it makes a big difference for us. It allows us to get on new radio stations around the country and bring new Internet listeners on board as well. And you get those benefits. Go to amp.freetalklive.com. One of them being access to the Discord server special supporters chat rooms that are normally off limits uh, to others. And there's a bunch of other benefits as well. Go to amp.freetalklive.com. Johnson, continue with more from Reason.com. Sure. So this. the article here continues by saying... While it's a commonplace 
that the service sector has dramatically increased at the expense of traditional industry and agriculture, Graeber points out that this does not mean that we are seeing an explosion of waiters, barbers, sales clerks, and the like. The proportion of such jobs has remained small and steady. The growth in the service sector consists primarily of such positions as administrators, consultants, clerical and accounting staff, IT professionals, and the like. That's like in, in the public school system, the number of administrators to teachers, it used to be like one to three, and now it's one to one. Oh, my God. Something like that. It's just crazy. Well, not all such jobs are BS. This is the place where BS jobs proliferate. He says, as an academic, I can testify to the relentless increase within the a academy in both the numbers of administrative staff and the weight of bureaucratic burdens they place on the facility. In particular, Graeber identifies the financial sector as a major generator of BS jobs. Inasmuch as the overwhelming bulk of its profit, uh, profits come from colluding with government to create and then to trade and manipulate various forms of debt, eliminating unneeded or harmful tasks would drastically cut the amount of labor needed to sustain the economy. Criticism of make work often focuses on the public sector, but... Sure. Graeber maintains that the problem is at least as pervasive in private industry. As Graeber notes, this thesis will meet with resistance from many libertarians who expect inefficiency from government, but not from markets. Graeber summarizes that what I'll call the first libertarian response. Since competing firms would never pay workers to do nothing, their jobs must be useful in some way that we simply do not understand. In well, I mean, right. That's that's ignorant of reality, right? Like that's what right. somebody who would say – somebody might say that who's never actually worked in a corporation that's mm -hmm. a large corporation. Because right. maybe at a smaller mom-and-pop level, they've got some of that stuff under more control because right. they can have more observation over what's happening. But the, the movie Office Space – addresses this very, very effectively, I think. And this is... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and need you to fill out those TPS. <laughs> okay. Well, this is the Pareto principle. The For the number of people in the organization, 50% of the work is done by the square root of the number of people working there. <laughs> so if you have... Okay. If you have four people working there, then half the work is done by half the people, which is pretty good. But then when you get like 10,000, then half the work is done by 100 people. Mm. That's and so the larger the uh, organization becomes, the less efficient it becomes. Right. And and in the office space, which I think somebody called in about recently and said it's now almost 20 years old yeah, or it's, yeah. it's coming up on its 20th anniversary. Mm -hmm. right. um, great Mike Judge comedy. If you've never seen it, go check it out. Uh, but in that movie, they bring in a consultant. Right. And that's just part of the movie is them looking at these people's jobs and seeing why do we have you here? Right. Like justify your job to us. And it's a hard thing for some of these guys to do. Now, it's just a movie, but they're they're talking about reality because in a large corporation, one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing half the time, right? right? right. One department doesn't know what another department is doing. I mean, even you know, Free Talk Live isn't a corporation, okay? It never has been. It's just a show. But there are some there are some, you know, moving parts within this this group of people that does this show. And sometimes there's communication breakdowns within just the three to five mm -hmm. people that are the core uh, movers and shakers behind the scenes here. So, like, you take those failures on a small level like this and you take it out to, like you're saying, 10,000 right, employees right. or whatever. And there's going to be tremendous waste. Will it be as bad as the government waste? No. But it can be still can pretty be bad. bad. And and then you might wonder, well, then how do these large organizations continue to exist if they're, they're so inefficient? Well, there's three reasons. One of them is brand recognition, mm -hmm. because people can only like uh, comprehend a limited number of brands. And so they start to recognize one and they'll buy it, even if there's other competition. Right. Another reason is economies of scale. And then the third reason is... Um, government doing things that favor large corporations. Right. The protectionism, which protects big companies from upstarts, innovators, people who would otherwise be able to start a business, but they're prevented from doing so because they can't afford the licensing fee right. or they can't afford the building right. or the mandatory it, stove. It or masquerades whatever. as yeah. a crackdown on corporations when really what it is it's is they're protection. adding they're adding yeah. regulations that only large corporations will survive. So I just want to repeat this because it goes on here in the next paragraph. But he's uh, Graeber maintains that the problem is at least as pervasive in private private industry. And saying 
Uh, since competing firms would never pay workers to do nothing, their jobs must be useful in some way that we simply do not understand. Sort of tongue-in-cheek. Um, in reply, Graeber challenges his critics to explain how employees who spend most of their workdays surfing the Internet or creating cat memes are, are secretly fueling profits. Yeah, they're not. He, he also points to cases where such a job goes unfulfilled for months or years with no adverse consequences. Or in extreme circumstances where the holder of a job stops coming into work and no one notices. <laughs> right. A six-month bank strike in Ireland, he notes, caused far less economic disruption than a 10-day strike of garbage collectors in New York two yeah. years <laughs> earlier. The Irish coped by circulating checks as though they were cash. Hmm. Graeber is right to be unimpressed by the first libertarian response, but... He, as he himself notes, a different response is available to grant that private sector BS jobs exist, but argue that they're the product of government interference. Graeber is extremely dismissive of the second libertarian response, so much so that he apparently forgets about it a few pages later when he claims that doctrinaire libertarians always insist on the first response. But before he forgets that second response, he characterizes it as the product of a naive faith in the magic of the marketplace and objects that it objects that it's circular and can't be disproved since all actually existing market systems are to some degree state regulated. He writes, it will always be possible to assign the results one likes to the market and the results one dislikes to the government. This response is surely too quick. Disentangling the contributions made by different components of a social system is difficult, but it's hardly impossible. Uh, uh, other, well, otherwise, there'd be no such thing as social science. Yeah. So even in the libertarian perfect world of no institutionalized monopoly, coercive, you know, coercive force being eliminated from human interactions, that's not going to solve the problem of laziness. It's yeah. not going to solve the problem of you know failure of oversight of your business and the inefficiencies of these massive companies. I mean, that's, those are all problems that will continue to exist and continue to be a challenge. Um, so I, I agree that these libertarian objections are pretty weak, and we can continue here with more. Your calls and thoughts are welcome. Our number is 855-450-FREE. The more robust competition you have in an industry, the less waste and pointlessness you have. But uh, we got more coming up here. It's Free Talk Live. It's Free Talk Live. You can dial in toll-free here, and you can bring up anything that you want. Our number is 855-450-FREE. That's 855-450-3733. We're talking about BS jobs and the amount of waste that exists in the corporate system. And I think it's an important thing to acknowledge here because uh, – and can you give the the author of uh, the book credit again if you don't David mind? David Graeber. David Graeber, and the book was called BS Jobs. Uh, yeah, uh, an analysis. Something about something that. Like that. Um, and I think that – you know, I think that it's definitely true that there's tremendous waste in, in, corporate wor- in the corporate world, and anybody who's worked in it has seen it. Um, does that mean it is as wasteful as the government? No, uh, because – in the government world, the waste is rewarded, right? Mm-hmm. Like whenever waste happens, they get a bigger budget the next year because with the government, um, they can just tax endlessly. Right. They can just keep going back to the tax. And the states brag over how much they're spending on public education without right. regard to actual results. They and- should be bragging about getting good results for the least amount of money. But they've never been able to do that because when they get good results, well, they can get more money because of that. But they get more money when they get bad results, too. So Mm -hmm. really, ultimately, it it doesn't matter. Uh, Let's go to Bad Slave. He's on the line in our Discord call-in room. Go ahead, Bad Slave. Hello? Bad Slave. Going once. Hi. Hi, you're on the air. I'm here. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, (laughs) Something kind of drastic happened in front of me on Uh the... uh, the, uh, State of the Union. Oh, uh, and I'm just, I'm just, I'm not listening. Is it listening. because I'm Tiffany Trump wore white? Is that what it, it is? Anyways, getting back to our discussion, uh, I wanted to say that uh, that basically, where you know, besides government and corporations, uh, that, you know, 
the, I, I think that the corporate privilege, which is supplied by coercion through the government, will be uh, the, you know, the death, if we eliminate it, will be the death of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of BS jobs. So can I mean, you, I, I just can't you're imagine. Saying, let me see if I understand what you're saying there. You're saying that because the government gives these corporations certain privileges, like, you know, the ability to not have competition through licensing and mm-hmm. restrictions and regulations, that in the absence of these things, these corporations would become more accountable to the marketplace because they would be more likely to be competed with? Uh, absolutely. And I think... Um, also, you know, the, the, the focus is the limitation of liability, where, where you limit liability and, and the, the worst uh, sanctions are not applied to the principles of corporations, uh, those people are, are getting off. Right. So like a good example of that, and, and thank you for the call, Bad Slave. I appreciate it. Uh, so a good example of that would be the, you know, the BP oil spill, right, where tremendous uh, damage was done to property as a result mm-hmm. of that. And those executives were completely immune from any kind of personal consequence. In fact, their company was actually virtually immune from any serious economic consequences because the federal government has a law that limits the amount of liability that that company has to pay as far as cleanup and things like that. They only had to pay like, I think, again, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it was like nothing, like $75 million, like a drop mm-hmm. in the, literally a drop in the bucket uh, for, for an oil company. And the taxpayers picked up the rest of the bill. So that's an, that's an example of that. So, Johnson, we're not going to be able to get through the rest of this no, story, and I don't think not. we really we really need to. In one of the next paragraphs, I was looking at it over here, he gives this example of the private colleges that are increasing their staff members at a greater clip than the public colleges. And so he, the, the author – so this isn't the reason guy, the, right. the guy who wrote the book – um, he gives this example as, oh, well, see, here's an example of how the inefficient the marketplace is. And that's, that's not a fair example. I mean, we can all acknowledge the inefficiencies that exist in the marketplace, mm-hmm. but they're nowhere near as bad as government. So here he's trying to say, well, see, the government schools, college, is more efficient than the private uh, college. They're increasing their employees at a, a much higher clip in the private colleges, he says, as compared to the government colleges. And what he doesn't acknowledge is the idea that the money is guaranteed. Right. Their, By their the customer, government. Right. Yeah. The, their customer base is guaranteed. If you're running a private college and you can take federal loans for your students, uh-huh. then there's no disincentive. There's no reason that you wouldn't want to just keep on expanding the salaries and hiring new people and making the college bigger because you can just keep raising the rates. So, it's a guaranteed loan. So one thing that's kind of interesting that the, that the author of the Reason article addresses in sort of critiquing David Graeber's point there that you're, you're talking about yeah. the uh, universities is he talks about how David Graeber, Graeber has even cited work from Kevin Carson, who is, I guess, sort of a notable uh, libertarian. And uh, there's one line here that says, according to Carson's analysis, insulation from competitive discipline turns favored firms, in other words, government favored firms, into islands of central planning, Mm -hmm. Mm. protecting executives from the cost of inefficient decisions. Yeah. So, you know, that kind of makes sense that as they grow and as they have to do more of these, you know, bureaucratic things and deal with more regulations that this is inevitably the effect of... Yeah, I I discovered this running a business myself is that there's all these regulations Mm -hmm. which are complicated. And, you know, I'm a fairly intelligent person and I'm a lawyer. Yeah. And I found it challenging to get a handle of all of these regulations and all these forms I'm supposed to file and all these. Which is why people hire lawyers in a lot of cases. Yeah. Or or they hire uh, an HR specialist or something like that. They in a larger corporation, they have people who specialize simply in compliance with these rules and regulations that apply for all right. businesses. Compliance including... officer. That's the exactly. name of that job. Exactly, yes. Right. I'd and... love to find out. Somebody, I wish there was a lawyer or somebody out there that would, that could um, specialize in gracefully navigating noncompliance. In other words, <laughs> figuring out the fees 
And the because I, my theory is that non-compliance would be significantly less costly in the long run than compliance. You I sort of as- did that to for a bunch of other immigration attorneys. We yeah. were talking about the. Uh, the Obamacare, and I was basically saying to everybody, you know what, I figured a way around this. <laughs> I told like, everybody the information. They're like, I'm going to do that. Yeah, like so, planning for fines. Fine, right? Yeah, planning for the well, fines okay. and planning for dealing with the fines as they Here's come. Here's how the fine works. The fine is uh, deducted from your tax return, mm-hmm. and if you you don't have a tax, or if you don't have a tax refund, which most self-employed people don't, mm. it doesn't go on your credit report, and they don't sue ah. you for it. It rolls over to your next refund okay but if you you don't get which you don't get so if you're self-employed and you never get a refund which most self-employed people don't you never put you in jail they can't put you in jail over it no sweet no so i said just just don't do it but johnson when you're dealing with um certain regulations like let's say um our friend will coley uh, the the muslim guy who opened up a Mm -hmm. mosque here in Keene, he wanted to put a sign up I think he went about it the wrong way by asking permission because then they said no. Right. If he had just put the sign up, you then have the question of whether or not they're going to come after you. But if they do come after you, then they can usually hit you with a per day fine. So it's not like they're just going to come at you and be like, well, that's $300 one time. No, it's $300 per day. Now, if what you're saying is that in a corporation, all the compliance officers and attorneys – they actually would cost more than whatever paying the fines would be, then you may be onto something. But mm. in certain cases, especially on a smaller business dealing with like a local government, it's going to be way too burdensome to, you know, try to deal with whatever court case you would have to, to deal with to, to fight those fines. Because paying $300 a day for any kind of stupid ordinance violation is just going to be out the window. That's not even well, an option. Yeah, that's yeah. You know, when they start to get huge. Yeah. But I mean, if you can plan for that in advance, like there might be certain regulations that you could. You know, in other words, that's what I'm saying, gracefully sort of navigating which mm-hmm. ones are, because I'm sure that there is there is a, a window of opportunity there where he, there's probably massive amounts, especially for a larger organization or as an organization yeah. is growing to um, avoid some of these. I mean, well, I love the, the idea. cost of, you know, just administrative, you know, it's pointed out here, like all these administrative things, all the paperwork. And I it's imagine tremendous. Even, especially in you know, healthcare industry, stuff like that. It's the hiring the attorneys alone to try to navigate this stuff when even many of the attorneys themselves are overwhelmed and confused uh, by these situations. It's not my area of expertise. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's ridiculous. And I, I hope that we can see more efficiency come to the marketplace without government being involved because it definitely does make things worse, but it still won't ever be perfect. We'll mm-hmm. still deal with corruption in business. We'll mm-hmm. still deal with you know inefficiency in business. And luckily, if it's an open marketplace where you actually have the ability to compete without having to bow down to government regulations, then if you see an inefficient business, that's an opportunity to create one that's more efficient and outcompete those people. Uh, so we'll see you tomorrow online. In the meantime, you can join us over at freetalklive.com. The Free State Project has reached its goal of 20,000 liberty lovers who've pledged to move to New Hampshire and get active to achieve liberty in our lifetime. Perhaps you're trying to figure out what part of New Hampshire should be your destination. If so, consider Keene. You'll find more than 150 reasons to move to Keene at move.freekeene.com. Keene is famous for its historic, publicity-generating activism, as well as being the liberty media capital of the world. It's home to freekeene.com, New Hampshire's destination for liberty activism, news, and opinion. For years, we've been compiling over 150 reasons to move to Keene at move.freekeene.com, where you'll learn about some of what's happening here and what makes Keene a great place to live. If you love liberty, you'll probably enjoy anywhere you end up in the Shire. But do your due diligence first. Please visit move.freekeen.com for the full list of over 150 reasons to move to Keene. That's move.freekeen.com.